we appear to be live on YouTube. I'm going to double check that. And yes, we are live. Great. Well, since we're live and it's after six and we have quorum, I suggest we go ahead and get started. There will, of course, be some other members joining us here in a minute. Uh, so this is the June meeting of the Ithaca Planning and Development Board. Uh, and let's start with introductions. Emily, could I start with you? Sure. Emily Petrina, member of the board. Mitch? Mitch Glass, member of the board. Anya? Anya Harris, City of Ithaca staff. Lisa? Um, Lisa Nicholas, I'm the Deputy Director of Planning and staff to the board. Nikki? Nikki Sarah, Environmental and Landscape Planner, City of Ithaca. McKinsey? Vice Chair of the Planning and Development Board. And I'm Rob Lewis, like I am Chair of the Board, and it looks like Garrick is joining us too. Well, rather than wait for that to load, let's uh, go ahead and move into agenda review. Lisa, are there any changes to the agenda as written? Um, there may be. So, um, so well, one thing is, is that under um, zoning appeals, we, oh yeah, we have both zoning appeals, that's right. And then um, um, uh, 815 South Aurora may come. They said they would and uh, to talk about materials. And so we would put that as the first project under site plan approval. Okay. So I didn't change the agenda for that. Reasonable, thank you. Uh, next up, we have approval of minutes. I did see a couple months worth go out of email um, and I don't remember what months those were. Anya, what months were those? We had February of 2021 and May of 2021. All right. Is there a motion somewhere for the approval of February and May 21 meeting minutes? I saw Emily move. And is there a second? I saw Mitch second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving said minutes? Those minutes are approved. Um, and Garrick, hey, Garrick, I didn't see your hand. Um, Although four votes does approve those minutes. So perhaps that's an abstention. Um, with that, we go into public comment. Oh, Garrick, Garrick also approves the minutes. Sorry, I'm in, I'm in my car, so I have limited. I'm, I'm going to abstain on everything until I get back to my house in five minutes. Understood. That seems entirely reasonable. Thanks, Garrick. Um, <laughs> Lisa, is there any uh, public comment uh, at today's meeting? I have one comment to be read into the record. Um, I'll go ahead and do that. And we have one member of the public waiting in the waiting room. Wait, okay. Why don't Wait. I I'll read it first and then we can let, um, let him Hector. in. Okay. Or you can let him in now and I'll read this first. Okay. Um, so this is from Historic Ithaca. Dear planning board members, several proposed projects on the June agenda indicate that the applicants will demolish existing buildings for their new projects. These are 615 to 617 Cascadilla Street to demolish one existing two-story residential house, 228 Dryden Road, demolish the existing two-story structure, 510 West State Street, MLK Junior Boulevard, remove the one-story commercial building fronting on state and two-story wood frame house fronting on West Seneca. As you know, the demolition and removal of these structures means the considerable loss of embodied energy through existing building materials. To help divert the volume of materials being headed to landfills and to keep items out of the waste stream, historic Ithaca and significant elements, request that the Planning and Development Board question the applicants about their plans for any opportunities for salvage of materials from the existing buildings or deconstruction of the buildings. Will any of the applicants allow for local nonprofits such as historic Ithaca and our significant element store to do a survey visit before the proposed demolition in order to remove materials such as doors, windows, fixtures, et cetera. We support the city of Ithaca's green building initiatives and hope that more 
Sustainable approaches can also be adopted when existing buildings are being replaced by new construction. Thank you very much for considering this request. Thank you. Uh, and then I believe we also have Hector Cheng here from the public. Hector, you have three minutes. Thanks. I don't think I'll use all three minutes up, but thank you very much for taking the time to hear uh, my public comment. Um, Hector Chang, I uh, work at Bywalk Tompkins, and I'm also a 10 year resident of the city of Ithaca. Um, affordable housing has always been a hot topic <laughs> in our community, and I'm here to just kind of speak on support of the 510 West MLK project. Uh, I'm very excited to hopefully see 58 families finally live in the city of Ithaca who are not necessarily, um, can, can't necessarily afford it right now, especially in a neighborhood that is very walkable, bikeable, transit, uh, you know, like with a lot of transit options so that people don't necessarily have to uh, buy a car to make their life work and also um, live a more sustainable and equitable life. So um, just putting it out there, hopefully you guys can get that project into BCA's hands out of here um, and then you can be done with it. <laughs> yeah, I hope. <laughs> that's, um, so that's about it. Thank you very much for all the work that you guys do in hearing what people have to say both um, in around the project um, and um, best of luck with the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much. Well, it sounded like that was it for public comment, but I'll check in with Lisa. Is there anything else for this, uh, for the public comment section of the meeting here? There is nothing else. Great. Uh, so we do have some time allocated for board response to public comment. Is there any member of the board wishing to respond to anything we heard in public comment? Seeing none, that brings us to subdivision review. And first up, we have Carpenter Circle. So it looks like, okay, Passero here and Tony Vota here. And Kate Chesbro. Just need to find out if they are expecting anybody else. Yeah. Are you expecting anybody else? No. Okay. Great. Uh, well, if, if the gang's all here, you could uh, take it away. Sure. Um, my name is Matt Newcomb. I'm with Pass Row Associates. Um, I'm here on behalf of Park Row Realty, Realty um, representing them for the subdivision application um, for the Cayuga um, Medical Center subdivision and um, Carpenter Park project. So we've been before this board a couple of times with different subdivision maps that are all the same but very different. <laughs> um, the first time we came in, we we included a uh, land swap between the gardens and the um, and the developer, which was always planned and always um, in the works. Uh, and we decided to halt that particular subdivision map um, or subdivision approval and move forward with one that, that did not include a land swap quite yet um, because we felt we could move forward with Cayuga Medical because um, there were some, some logistical things between the city and the owner or developer rather that were being worked out and in hopes that we could keep things moving. We then found in the conditions of approval that the land swap was required prior to the start of construction. So that put us back to the initial map that we submitted. So we're here tonight for the approval of basically the initial map that we had submitted um, that includes a land swap. It's a one for one land swap with the gardens. Um, and it also includes three other parcels that are to be subdivided out, one for Cayuga Medical, one for the affordable housing portion, and then the third um, for the mixed use um, development. Um, if there's any questions, feel free to ask me. Um, sorry if I went too quickly. No, we, we appreciate you being quick. Uh, as I recall in PRC, this was pretty simple, um, but you also had a map up during PRC or somebody did. And I think that would be helpful to look at uh, before we move into questions and, and probably quickly into a vote here. Yep, I have it 
right up on my computer and I will share that. I think it would be helpful just for the board. Yeah, oh, that's perfect. That's perfect. Yep. Yeah. So this is the, the subdivision map that also shows the colored uh, land swap. So the green areas are to be conveyed to the city of Ithaca. Um, currently, this is gardens right now where you see my mouse. And we're adding this portion to this garden, this, this part of the gardens to expand it and a small portion over here to square this off. We're also, this is also garden area um, that we're adding this portion of it to um, and then we're taking the red portion. So that's that's the gist of the land swap. Again, it's a one for one swap um, as far as the amount of land. Um, we've also worked with the gardens on improving their their areas, their plots, and, and getting some them some irrigation um, and doing lots of other things, some fencing and, and some sidewalks and some uh, barriers to keep some of the animals out. Um, so that's part of the land swap, um, you know, further down the road when it comes to construction. Um, and then we also have this lot here, which encompasses um, this Carpenter Park Drive here and back. That's the medical office building parcel um, known as lot one. Lot two, where my mouse is circling, would be the mixed use um, uh, housing retail project. And then lot three up here in the corner is the workforce housing uh, portion of the project. Um, again, very similar to what we've submitted in the past, just kind of a back, little bit of a back and forth, but I think we got it nailed down now. Great, thank you for that. Um, I'm just gonna open up the floor to board members. Are there any questions about what we've seen or questions about this revision to subdivision approval? Is there a general level of comfort in moving towards a vote? All right, I see nods. Elizabeth, you just joined us. Um, we're talking about a revision to the subdivision approval for Carpenter Circle. Uh, is there anything you want to catch up on or ask about before we move into a vote on this? And you are muted. I said, I don't think so. I don't have a problem with that. Great. Mackenzie, I saw your hand. Yeah, just out of curiosity, Matt, um, can you let me know the level of involvement of the community gardens and like, you know, their um, understanding of this and agreement with the swaps as it, with any changes? And also I'm curious like, what their level of involvement was with, you mentioned fencing and irrigation. Those sound like great improvements, you know, were those, were they part of designing those? Elements. Yes, they were. They, they were very, very involved in the design of, of everything, the irrigation, the fencing, um, the replacement of the sidewalk, to use it more as an animal barrier. Um, so we worked pretty diligently with them over the past year, year and a half, um, as we've moved forward on the other portions of the project to make sure they're getting um, an improved area um, that works well for them. And um, I think we've come up with a really good um solution for them as well as a lot better um setup for everybody so um they're happy we've worked like i said we've worked side by side with them the whole way great uh with that if there is a motion i would look for someone to move for revision to this final subdivision approval it's the orangish pinkish resolution in your packet i see emily move is there a second I see McKinsey second. Uh, before we move into a vote, which will be a roll call vote, uh, is there any member seeking further discussion? Seeing none, Emily, how do you vote? I agree. <laughs> I vote yes. Mitch. Yes. McKinsey. In favor. Elizabeth. Aye. Eric. Yes. I also vote yes, making this unanimous. So great. Uh, we appreciate your time today. Glad we were able to handle that uh, simply enough and good luck with the rest of your project. Thanks Thank you very much. much. Next up, uh, assuming that the team is here, we have an addition to the agenda at 815 South Aurora Street. I actually don't see them here. Um, okay. Well, that makes that real simple. Um, 
is the team for 401 here? Uh, some of them are. And... So Rob, just so you know, I'm now, I'm on board fully at home. Good to go. Sorry okay. about that. No worries. I'm not a good enough driver to be able to attend a board meeting at the same time. So I'm just impressed. Well, I, I couldn't. That's why I didn't vote. <laughs> I, I had to pull over. All right, good Jeff. Good evening, guys. Good evening. Are we waiting on members of your team or are you all here? Uh, we uh, waiting on a couple. Okay. Lisa, this was the one that had additional information mailed to us. That uh, no, addition, no, that's 510. Oh, okay. I mean, there was additional information in the packet, in your planning board packet, but mm -hmm. with 510, yeah. I think there but were But not things. the email one? Okay. Yeah. I see. But Jeff, I think we can get started with stuff while folks are coming on because I have all the information, just not to keep uh, these, these guys waiting okay. for us. Are you okay with that? I'm fine with that. Okay. So good evening, folks. James Trasher. Jeff is here. You know, Donnie Kim and Tim Fish. Tim Fish is on now as well. So um just a brief update. We were with the zoning board last month and we're back at the zoning board um, uh, for their next meeting. Uh, but in the meantime, while we're uh, working through that approval process, um, just wanna go through some updates. So the first item that we'll go through this evening and I'll share my screen in one second is uh, the landscape um, plan. Um, and the updates that we have done there, and we can walk through those comments. So one second here, share, Beep. share. So everyone should see the landscape plan on my screen. We do. Okay, it's regenerating. So um, we've gone through um, multiple iterations of this and we'll start at the first page where um, it's regenerating slowly. So uh, the landscape plan, uh, as, as we've gone through time, there's been different comments as it remains uh, on trees and the fire access way and its interaction uh, with Six Mile Creek. So the, the pages that you see right now is the overall uh, landscape plan we've put into uh, the plan as well as requested sort of uh, examples of what things would look like in terms of um, the benches, the park benches. Uh, we've highlighted the trees. There's been comments um, as it relates to the trees, making sure that they're more native species. So we've, our landscape architect, Amy Franco has tried to accommodate that. Um, the, the last meeting, uh, the biggest comments were on the end section where we have the fire turnaround and this area that we show here. Um, so our, our architects and our landscape architects have worked on showing uh, representative um, uh, scenarios of what this would look like in terms of the design. And so these two renderings that were prepared that are part of your packet uh, highlight what we're looking at doing and putting and a Virginia creeping um, uh, vine uh, on that wall. We've we've changed the retaining wall from uh, to a a, a wood uh, lag wall, and then we've terraced this uh, area in the landscaping. So I, I apologize with internet things are changing on my screen, and I don't even know why they are. Um, but this area, um, so. Those are comments that Mitch had had previously and other folks on the board. So we've updated that. Um, and then at the end of the trail as well, where we had, head off into uh, city water property, we have the uh, uh, historical information trail signage board where we, we head off in those regards. 
um, picnic tables, benches, planter boxes that we have highlighted through the site. So a lot of this we have gone through before, but really the biggest um, updates have been on uh, the end section to provide, you know, um, some greater life in the vegetation at the uh, end of the building. Um, so that's what we've done on landscaping. Um, Tim, do you want to go through the few updates that we have made on the bricks and the um, sure. facing Six Mile Creek? Yep. So I'll stop and sharing. Let me um, actually we did have some more landscape renderings um, hot off the presses. So this is again, that retention area, you know, that we talked about doing some additional landscape um, in that area. And then also, you know, we, we attempted to rendering, you know, basically how, how the planting would start to, you know, tear us down the walls around that lag lagging wall, um, you know, over on the other side. Um, so with that, um, you know, I can pick, Click the right. Um, I can, you know, I can go over the basically the facade changes um, first, and then I'll I'll jump into the um, to the updated um, kind of just brick size. So, um, as you may or may not know, I, I assume you know is you know we've been working on um, some revisions to the elevations to get them to set back at the top floor, consistent with the um, you know request on from the um, Zoning review, so you can start to see, um, you know, how how those start to step back um, in the elevation a little bit, um, as compared to the previous um, design. So again, just the way the elevation is drawn a little bit in three dimension, you can see the setbacks from the top of the building, and you can also see we um, actually added um, back the. Um, basically the Juliet balconies um, in these recessed areas on, um, on the east wing. Tim, I'm sorry to interrupt. Are mm -hmm. you trying to show, I think you may have a screen up that is not addressing your talking oh, points. No. Uh, you, have to, you have to stop sharing the, you have to stop sharing the screen you were sharing. In order okay. To change. Yeah. Sorry about that. Oh, I see. Yep, sure enough. All right. <laughs> Did we get it that time? The same. It's still the landscape plan. Okay. All right. One more time. Sorry. How about now? There, you go. there we go. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Too many screens going on. Um, so uh, again, I'll um, go back. So, so there are the um, current elevations. Um, sorry, I'm getting back situated here. Okay, um, so you can see the, the new elevation up above and the previous elevation down below and start to see those setbacks on the top level as you see the elevation in, in perspective. So then to zoom in a little bit. Um, so we've also added back um, the Juliet balconies um, over on the east wing in these insets that was, that was mentioned before. Um, so that's the kind of overall um, approach to that. Any any comments on that? And I can show you the, the new brick size. We'll try to do comments at the end once you get okay. through the materials. Okay, fine. Thank you. Uh, get to the right view here too. Let's see, where'd that one go? Well, um, just moving on to the setback. So again, here you can see the um, uh, setbacks 
again in perspective um, how that works from the upper floor setting back over here and setting back you know from the top floor and let me see if i can find my link for the brick here. for the brick comparison tim i have it uh, yeah for some reason i lost that tab so if you can share that one thank you i think you need to unshare your screen first tim there we go Thanks. So, so we originally, you know, looked at a modular brick as shown on the left, um, and basically as you know, as the scale of the building, and um, frankly, also the uh, you know the, the cost um, analysis. We are now proposing to use a um, utility size brick. Um, you know, I think it'll still really give the same appearance that we had previously. Um, just save some labor in terms of the overall um, overall project, but you know the same type of brick, the same um, kind of buff mortar that we were proposing before. Okay, thank All you right. very much. Thanks. Thanks, James. We'll uh, go around the room and try to get reactions from various members of the board. Emily, if I could start with you. Sure. Um... I think the changes seem good. I, it seems like there's more balconies today than there were in PRC, um, which I think is a, is a good thing. Um, the brick size makes perfect sense to me. I think the facades are so large that that slight change in scale, if it saves labor and money, I think that is fine from a um, aesthetic perspective. And I'm, I really like these perspectives looking west and looking east that, that are new. Because we've been, you know, we've been looking at the long elevations and everything looks so flat. But when you see this perspective from a person's height, mm -hmm. there's a lot of movement. There's a lot of reveals mm -hmm. and detail between windows and the different panels. So um, I'm really glad to see those. Um, I have a question about parking. So this is kind of diverging from what you presented today. It occurred to me that I don't remember hearing what you're doing with parking that is for the gateway, is it the gateway building? That will be your neighbor. I know that when your project is complete, you'll have parking for them in your garages, but what will they do during construction? Yeah, I'll take that. We, um, we've been working with um, David Lubin and the Chainworks property as our parking location for the Gateway Center um, tenants and uh, construction workers during construction. And um, it's ample parking. I mean, anyone who's been up there, uh, I mean, there's a lot of surface spaces. Uh, that's one solution. I don't think it's the only solution. There may be other alternatives um, that are kind of one off from that, but uh, at a minimum that would be available to our, um, you know, the gateway tenants, uh, employees of the construction company or subcontractors we plan to provide shuttle service to and from that lot during construction. So we want to make this as, um, as comfortable as we can uh, during the construction period. So I know that some of the businesses in there have walk-ins like accounting, architecture. Mm -hmm. And so it might be worth considering some sort of a few spots for like short-term drop-ins of, of clients that wouldn't necessarily yeah, yeah and, enough for the shuttle. So. And we um, thankfully we're not taking away all of the gateway parking, the parking that exists um, right as you come into Gateway Center and um, kind of around the um, the office building will remain for the most part. So it won't be void of parking. Uh, there'll be the short term parking option that's still, you know, that will remain intact. And, uh, you know, if, if we need to make some improvements during the process to you know support the tenants and our neighbor i mean we'll be as accommodating as we can be but i think we've got a reasonable solution that seems to satisfy the gateway um landlord and uh, and i know the tenants are you know now involved in that discussion okay thank you mm -hmm. garrick Sorry, Rob. Uh, yeah, I agree with everything Emily said. I don't have anything else to add. Thank you. Mackenzie. 
Thank you. I will echo that I appreciate the east and west elevations. Those are really helpful. And um, I'm starting to see a little bit more life in the building um, than I think we have yet. You know, it's, 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 um, I'm feeling warmer about it. Um, I hope it's okay for me to ask a couple of not specifically site plan review questions, just because we have the time. Sure. I think um, in the effort of transparency with the, um, with the public and also out of my own curiosity, I have two questions. One, is there any commitment to local or union labor on this project? There is a, and we just went through our um, IDA uh, tax abatement hearing and, and were approved last week or the week before, and they're mm -hmm. kind of running together. And in that, the um, in our application, we stated a goal of local labor, and this is construction labor, during the construction period of 35%. In reality, I think it will be much higher than that. And, and city center is a good comp. We have the same contractor and as they audited that local labor um, number at completion, I think it was closer to 50% of the um, construction employees being from the local region, which would include Tompkins County, I think local is is a little bit broader. I think it's also the adjacent counties. So, you know, I'm not completely sure of the definition of local in that context, but, you know, that is certainly the goal. You know, our own permanent staff, you know, which we will have, call it 10 full-time employees working at the property ongoing, will they'll become local. You know, we may hire within Ithaca, uh, we may bring in, um, you know, some candidates from elsewhere, uh, but over time, you know, they will become residents of Ithaca. There, there's no doubt. Thank you. I appreciate that response and, um, and that commitment, and I'm hoping for the high percentage. Um, and you spoke of the IDA and the tax abatement. Can you um, let me know what level of transparency can we have into um, payments into the affordability fund? Um, and how does that coincide with the tax abatement um, or, you know, how do those two things yeah. coexist within yeah. the IDA? Yeah, they are, they are closely linked and um, in the payment and, and what we're doing in that vein is a payment in lieu of, um, and it's $5,000 per unit. In our case, it's, um, you know, it's $1.7 million or so plus or minus. <clears throat> and we make that payment at least in part at the closing of the IDA agreement, which would coincide with our closing of the land. And, uh, and, and so in order for us to be in receipt of the tax abatement, we have got to you know, fulfill those payment obligations. Okay, thank you, that's yep. helpful. That's it for me, Rob. Thank you, Mitch. Yeah, thanks. Um, I appreciate the, your responses to the comments from the PRC meeting, um, adding some balconies back in. I thought that was good and appreciate the upper level setback. I think that makes a lot of sense. So um, I wish you luck with the BZA and I think we should continue to support this project um, given all the things we've talked about in terms of uh, how this building will sit uh, on the site. Um, the landscape seems okay. Um, I feel like I still need or want a little more detail about that pass through from State Street down to the Creek Walk. I have no sense of that space and I'm worried that's just going to be a couple benches in there. And, and I think that needs to be kind of a signature uh, public space. And, you know, we've other projects on State Street, as Asteri and things, we've spent a lot of time on the pass through spaces um, because these are these are really important. You know, they're going to be people places who, uh, where people don't live in the building and, and they're gonna be used a lot. And I, and I know it kind of ties into the, what's the name of the fraternity there, that, that space also, but it would really help to see that whole composition when it's ready uh, in much more detail, um, you know, with even a rendering um, and night views, lighting is critical to make it safe and um, accessible, but, um, yeah, I just appreciate the work that you continue to do on this project. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. Um, I think you've gotten good comments from the crew. Uh, like Emily and Mitch, I appreciate the changes that were made since PRC. 
I think the general sense. Uh, oh, Elizabeth, I am sorry. It's Elizabeth. Uh, could you <laughs> let me turn it over to you? I apologize for that. Everyone, I'm having trouble with my camera, so I keep turning it off because it freezes all of you. Um, I, th I think I really like the elevation now. I, I, I think that you're headed in the right direction. I don't think the larger brick is going to be um, an issue. Actually, it might be a good thing. Um, I'm still not all that happy about the terrace, the way that it looks. I almost wanted that whole retention wall to be terraced. Um, but yeah, is the payment that you have to make just one time? I think it can be structured in uh, a series of payments. We're still working through the uh, agreements with the IDA, uh, but I think historically they've allowed it to be paid, I think, in two installments. And, and I'm not certain of that, but I, I have heard that approach. It is. So they, they, you can either have a lump sum or an installment payment, and based on size, you know, being the number of units and the amount they request, they've allowed. Um, multiple payments. So, um, and typically a portion comes at the beginning and a portion comes in after like year one when they have some stabilized rents. And then are you able to share with us any market studies you've done? Do you know what the rent will be for like a two bedroom, three bedroom? Or is it just two bedrooms? No, no, no. It's a mix of units from studio one, two, and three bedroom units. We, we've got initial rents underwritten and, and I'll just as a benchmark, you know, they're comparable to um, city center and Herald Square. I think those are the two most relevant comps given proximity and um, in size of property and, you know, just type of building um, with slight discounts in certain areas. I mean, it's, you know, driven by unit size in some cases, by location of unit, you know, unit with a balcony, unit without a balcony. There's a lot of variables that dictate the ultimate rental program, but um, it's it's driven ultimately by um, market data uh, in Ithaca. Okay, but you can't share us a range. Um, I can certainly share a range, um, but it would take a a little explanation to go through the range. I can give you highlights now. Let me pull up our underwriting. Okay. You just give me a second. <clears throat> so uh, a typical studio rent um, is approximately, let's call it 1750 um, in current dollars. A one bedroom is, let's call it right around 2000 in current dollars. A two bedroom is, call it $2,500 per month uh, in current dollars. And a three bedroom is right around 3000. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. Appreciate sure. it. Lisa, I see your hand. I just, I had um, a, a comment and a question. Uh, the first is I'll do the question. Well, I'll do the comment first. I really think that the reduction in the balconies is, it's, it was so much better. The elevations are so much better with those larger balconies and with the more balconies. And I, would love to see that back. Um, I think it really added a lot to the building. And I think that's a shame that they've been reduced so much because they don't really seem to follow a pattern now. They just seem dispersed. Um, so the other ones were longer and there were more of them in a more regular pattern. So I would love to see those. Can I, yeah, Lisa, the, can I, yeah, yeah can I, remember, I remember what the explanation was that it was privacy, but I still think that I still think you could figure out a way to do it. Um, yeah. And then the other, the question is the, the I, we got to, uh, where is this lagged wood retaining wall? I thought that the, the retaining wall in the back had been changed from 
uh, masonry to a lagged wood. Am I, am I wrong about that? Or is that in another location? Oh, that's here. So, Tim, can you bring it up in your renderings? Because I think your renderings show it better than you're at mute. Tim? I'm sorry, I'm looking for getting, getting the screen back. There we go. Yeah, it is, it's that area over there. Can you see the screen? That's not masonry anymore, it's this lagged wood. That's correct. Okay. All right. Okay. right. And then uh, get to, to the right rendering. So, so basically, the intent is, you know, to get to to grow landscape, you know, from the base and from the top of the, um, you know, the grade over the lagging of, you know, uh, so over time, it it really should become a green wall, not initially, but you know, nature will take its course. And but that other intent. element, that other element, is still masonry. The that's terraces correct. Are masonry. Okay. All right. right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, but in the rendering, is that terraced then the lag wall? It looks no, it's it is. The the okay. lag wall is vertical. That's correct. Oh, okay. How tall is that? No, it it varies. Um okay. but it goes from several feet up to like 12 feet high mm -hmm. in the center. Okay. So lower and closer to the you know city property far end down where the trail extends mm -hmm. a couple feet mm -hmm. back near the end of the building 10 to 12 feet right i mean th the thought was actually you know it's it's hard to to render the landscape but with you know with the hill coming down you know the intent was you know for it to really be more natural um and mesh into the existing landscape mitch go ahead can we um, just take a step back and and uh, pick apart Lisa's comment about the balconies a little bit more? Because I, I'm interested in having a deeper discussion about that. I, I wasn't aware of that her opinion on that, which I respect. And um, I thought they had removed a lot, but then put back uh, some. So, so I'd like to be clear on, on what's been lost specifically here. And what's been put back? Sure. I think at one point in time, we, we had balconies that spanned basically two, you know, two of these bays or one of the larger brick bays. So they've become narrower, narrower. You can see it in the, in the image rendering below. Yeah, below, yeah. Right? Um, the rendering below. Yeah. Yes, there you go. Good, good point. Zoom back on this. But then we, we pointed that out at PRC that it was a shame that it was you know you were losing so much balcony space but then you you put some back for today right is that that's that's right we put we put balconies back um here um basically at these insets here and here but they're they're, they're juliet balconies they're, they're juliet not, that's right yeah, right in mm -hmm. their original design they were full they were actual balconies correct that's, is that correct that's, that's what it looks like on the that's record. correct so i i think that having looked at this a little more, uh, you know, I'm inclined to agree with Lisa's comment, uh, and I'd be interested um, in the reaction of anybody else on the board on that. Yeah, I think so too. I, I didn't realize those were Juliet balconies, and I, I thought there might have been a move on the actual the other brick facades, uh, but it doesn't appear that you did any there, and um, especially on that like far left wing, the wing to the far west. There's those mm -hmm. two lonely bal there's those two lonely balconies right there. If you pan over the elevation, you'll see like mm -hmm. a much longer facade that I think Emily had said the word islands. You know, these things are like mm -hmm. islands. So I I kind of tend to agree now that we're looking at this a little bit more that there might be additional places where you can mm -hmm. put some back on the main facade, not just on the the insets. Gotcha. It's it's you know it's we're uh, just trying to trying to get the budgets to work too. I mean, 
Can yeah, you know? and that's part of this, to be honest with it you is. guys. It really is. You know, we are we are facing such uh, material price increases. Um, you know, we're trying to be smart with the choices we make. Some of it's programmatic, but some of it is budget driven, and just to be very, you know, transparent about it. So we're we're trying to to weather a Armageddon of material shortages and price increases that are continuing to rise. So that, that influences some of our decisions here. Any other questions or comments from board or staff before we start looking at the conditions? Mackenzie. Thank you. Um, do we have a percentage of uh, like greenery to pavement or you know percentage of greenery on the site? Um, and any comparison from existing or if there's even any change from the existing state? As it goes we do, green. We do have that in the part three, but I don't find it. Okay, I couldn't find it. Yeah. And, and I don't have it sitting right off the top of my head, mm -hmm. but uh, existing condition between building and parking areas in our proposed development, the green space, um, I think we're fairly even, and I will try to find it um, um, quickly here if I can. Okay, Lisa, Some I feel like sometimes there's, um, I feel like I'm unclear about if it's like 12% or 25%. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, down, yeah, downtown is slightly different. We don't actually have a percentage. I, it was in the part three under stormwater and we could talk about that next. I mean, you're not taking any action tonight, but. I mean, part of the conditions can be a list of things you'd like to continue to look at or want more information on. Um, that certainly is information that is available, but maybe just not at our fingertips right, mm -hmm. right now. Um, look for it if you... That's okay. Don't, we don't need to spend any time yeah. to do it. Okay. I can look for it if I know that it's in yeah. the form conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. We can also add it, you know, a discussion of that into mm -hmm. the conditions if Okay. Any other questions or comments before we move into looking at those conditions? Seeing none, there's a document in your written materials titled 401 State MLK Junior SPA Conditions. Uh, it has, you know, three quarters of a page of standard conditions that I think are not necessarily worth diving into. Uh, and then, you know, another page-ish of other conditions. Uh, which I think is worth thinking about, thinking about if there's anything that's missing, uh, thinking about if there's, we want to be very specific about the form some of these take. Um, and also the applicant team at PRC, and I think in general has expressed an appetite to sort of have the complete list of what they owe us so that they can have line of sight towards the end of their process. And the conditions are a good way to get at that, right? Because, I mean, at this point, anything that we don't have, you know, we, we sort of, need to put on their radar or have written down that we need it in a condition type format. So uh, this is worth taking a little time on. We'll say they're in the process of working on the easements. That's just a, a procedural thing. I would say maybe um, where it talks about offsite contractor parking, maybe include with that the tenant parking, because it sounds like it might be one in the same with um, Janet. Makes sense. During construction. Yeah. On the landscape plan, submission of revised landscape plan uh, show detail of the plaza between state and Creek Lawford. Does that go here? Yeah. I think so. In fact, I wonder if you don't want to ask for more than that. I mean, because I don't know. I feel like what you're asking for with with the with your with your pass through, as you described it, uh, is more extensive than just a landscape plan. You mentioned furnishings and lighting. Furnishings, and lightings, renderings. I mean, that, that is a space that will be built as part of the project, right? I believe that's a question for the applicant. 
Oh yes, correct. Yeah, that that space is built up to the alpha phi alpha piece, where then we just have to coordinate. Or alpha phi alpha should be in at some point here in the near future to talk to you about what they're proposing to do on their site. I see. So you will tie into what they do. Well, they're going to sort of. We're going to be in front of them, so they're going to sort of tie into us. We've been in coordination with them throughout the process. We've had several calls, um, but at the end of the day you know, they got to come see you and you may want some changes of how they do their memorial and their improvements. But, you know, we've shown for coordination purposes, the connection point in terms of stairs connecting from State Street through their site to our site. So we can give you perspectives and renderings and lighting and, um, you know, hardscape details of what we would do between the building and the adjacent structure and the Alpha Phi Alpha area in Six Mile Creek. So we, we can show that for the next meeting. I mean, that seems like a condition that doesn't need to be satisfied now. It could wait till you have more detail and show, you know, and with, a, you know, you can, because you'll still have to build it in the future. That seems like something you could wait until you really know what, you know, or, or the board knows what they want there and it's coordinated with the other project. I don't, you know, with the landscape issues, they can be you, know, you you can wait till during construction to satisfy them because things change. Okay. It's fine with us. Any conditions that are on people's radar that aren't on this list? I have one. I have one. I've been thinking about this, Rob, about yep. the, the, so between the city retaining wall and the building, there's a big gap, um, which, um, you know, I, I think right now the, the, it, on the landscape plan, it says that there'll be cobble or riprap or something at the bottom of that gap. Um, I think, I mean, it might, you might want to see how that's going to look from the street because it will be something that you look over the edge and you will see that area be somewhat prominent. You know, the building will be beautiful and everything, but you will look down and see that. I don't know if you want more information on how that's treated. I think that makes sense. Um, you mentioned riprap and you mentioned looking out over it or down into it. You know, the, the thing that comes to my mind immediately is, is the ability to clean it. Uh, and of course, rip wraps not the easiest thing to go in and sweep. Uh, so, I mean, I think even, you know, a conversation about the maintenance of, of that kind of area. Uh, and actually, as soon as I say it, I, I, I'm thinking about maintenance of more than that, but things like the walk and whatnot. And I don't know that we have, I don't know that I have a full vision of what that looks like. Um, and that might be worth, you know, having as a condition and taking a look at. So I'm not getting a sense that there's these big layering chunks of project that we haven't addressed, which is good. Um, you know, I, I, it seems like we need a little bit uh, more detail on what's going to happen with the pass through, but maybe we don't have that yet um, because it's just not at a place where you, you know what you're doing there yet. And we can hold that as a condition. Uh, we also have some other conditions obviously on here there's a, there's a couple pages of them um but by and large they seem reasonable to me they don't seem like things that necessarily will take forever to to meet um so what's what's next steps lisa well they are going to go back to the bza um at the beginning of july and if they get their variance they will be back here for um you know preliminary or preliminary and final approval in july Okay. Are there any conditions that are currently on our list that would make it impossible for us to move on final approval if we felt like we were ready to do that? I don't think so. Um, um, I don't know what, you know, what I mean, you I don't know that to, we'll be ready. Yeah. What you want them to show 
next month, you know, do you want to look at the balconies again? Do you want to, you know, the things that you talked about wanting to see more of or um, could help? There were at least a couple voices on balconies. I think, I think looking at that next month makes sense. Um, I think, you know, without having you do a bunch of work that's not representative of anything that's a real plan, taking a look at the pass through makes a lot of sense. Uh, I would personally be interested in seeing, you know, some sketch out of what the maintenance of your public areas would be, um, publicly accessible areas would be. What else, if anything, from the board would you want to try to see next month and have eyes on before at least taking a vote on preliminary? Garrick. Yeah, Rob, sorry, sorry, this may have been mentioned, and forgive me, but just on the issue of maintenance and also doubling down on Mitch's comment about the benches and so on is I'm just want to be sure it's clear, you know, what are the maintenance responsibilities moving forward on the boundaries of public land and private land when it comes to regard to the trail, just to be clear. So for example, I, and I, I'm agnostic on how it's done, but if it's the expectation that the city is going to go in, for example, and do maintenance in the future, then they have to have a, some kind of way to access the property through the site. And I just wanna make sure that clear that that's all laid out however it wants to be done. So um, just say that. And, and some other, just why I had the floor, just a small comment. I really like these interpretive signs and I really appreciate the project has that. Um, I, I would, you know, certainly not a requirement from my point of view, but I would, I would appreciate uh, getting the chance to look at what they're thinking about putting on there and just point out that Mary Tomlin, um, city historian has done some really great work. If you go up to a uh, college town terrace, I think she did the, the interpretive signs for them. So, you know, it might be worth uh, reaching out to her or people like that, but really, really great to see that. Thanks, Eric. Elizabeth, I saw your hand. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was going to say, I'd like to see more detail on that masonry terraced wall that you have in that one corner. It seems like it's hidden by a tree in your rendering. So um, I feel like maybe it's not worked out or like to see some sections and how you plan on getting that built. Okay. All right. Any other things we want to make sure we look at next month? Seeing some shaking heads. All right. Well, I think that might be it. Um, you know, there's a list of conditions. There's a list of things that we definitely want to see. Um, and I think that there's an expectation we're going to take some kind of vote next month, assuming everything goes the way you hope it will at the zoning board. Um, so I'll wish you luck with that, and we'll see you in a month. Let me ask you real quick, Rob. Will we get a, a draft of those conditions before next month? Uh, I don't know. Lisa? Well, um, I, I mean, I will add to the conditions from what I heard tonight, and the board can always change them on the floor and add to them again, but you will get the resolution before the meeting with the final draft of the conditions that will be discussed at the board. So I, yeah. So yes, Yes. Uh, but they, but it could change. All right, well, if that does it, uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank you guys. Thank you. So I do see Patrick in the waiting room. Well, the next project is 510 West State Street, but do you want to go back to 4, um, 815? Yeah, we uh, can so do that. Okay. Um, I'll just let them in and there. see if he wants to talk about it. Sure. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. See Brandon's here as well. So before we jump into 510, I noticed 815 South Aurora wasn't on the agenda that had been mailed out. So uh, we do have materials to share for that. That's fine. Yeah, we're ready to look at that. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll see what action, if any, we can take on that tonight. Sure. I'll share my screen really quickly. So we took into account the comments that the board gave us last time about our proposed material change, and we sent a letter um, as well to the board detailing it verbally. But essentially what we wanna do is just like keeping in mind like how most of the structural construction costs are going up, like how can we keep the facade still interesting, high quality and more budget friendly? 
So our proposal is actually to keep the brick on the ground floor. The middle floors are already EFIS. We want to retain metal panels on the sides of the facade that are facing 96B. And then for the parts that are set back from 96B or not facing it directly, using a kind of uh, metal coat of paint on the drive it material that gives it the appearance of a metal panel. So the idea is that visually there really won't be any change in the material um, just in terms of how it's perceived. And I, uh, something I, that we outlined in the letter as well is that, uh, the idea that spending a little bit more money on facade materials where it matters most and then being a bit more utilitarian on the rest is a time-tested tradition in Ithaca. Look at any old traditional building where they'll put tin cornices on the front and the rest is just utilitarian punched windows and masonry walls. Um, I think we're doing way better than what those buildings are doing and ultimately the effect of turning the top floor into metallic painted um, EFIS isn't going to have a negative impact and it'll make the project more budget viable. All right, thanks. Uh, so we did get your letter via email. There was some email discussion that I could summarize as generally supportive, but need to see it. Um, and not everybody weighed in on that. So like, I think it's worth going around the room and sort of seeing where the board stands. Uh, and Garrick, you're on the top of my screen. So I'd start with you. You need a second. Garrick needs a second. Mitch. Uh, I, I support this. Um, I think it's a good, good, uh, good strategy. Appreciate the brick. Uh, being put back, and I think um, your approach is is fine. So thanks for um, meeting us in the middle on this. And before I move past you, Mitch, can I ask if there's anything else you need to see drawing wise before we would look at a resolution on this? No, I do not. I do not. Okay, Mackenzie. I also like the brick. Um, I think it's just kind of where we are with materials. You know, a lot of projects have to um, like cut some corners, and so. We can be flexible. I think we can be flexible around stuff like EFIS that we don't normally want to see, but I um, I trust those that went to see the materials also. And so I, I will be upfront that I didn't look at them in person when they were available. Um, I don't have anything that I need to see to feel comfortable moving forward with this project. Okay, Emily. Uh, I think it's a good compromise and I'm happy uh, with the proposal and I, you know, I think probably for the record, we would want to have elevations interior, you know, of the, the interior, not interior elevation to the building, but the passageway, interior passage elevations, as well as um, around all the sides, identifying exactly where the metal paint on drive it is going, just so that it, it is in the record. I don't know that that needs to come back to us, but. Um, we would need a record of that, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. So thank you. I feel comfortable with it. Elizabeth. Yeah, I'm also happy that you brought the brick back to the bottom um, course or the bottom floor. And um, did your mock-up have the painted uh, EFIS, the, the metal painted EFIS? No, I should have gone and checked that out. I didn't realize you were proposing metal painted. I, I don't think I've seen it. Is there uh, like any kind of reflective quality to that, like metal or? Um, I've been working remotely recently, so I didn't see the material myself, but the intent from the architects is that it'll look like metal panels, um, especially kind of where it is in the building further at a distance. Mm -hmm. um, I can pull up the drive it pages again or? I will say that the sample in person did not have a reflective quality, but I think even at the time it was discussed that that was not necessarily the full design intent. Okay. Um, all right, I was just curious. I think it's a fine compromise now that you have the um, brick underneath. Well, that sounds like a consensus. Uh, and with, oh, Garrick. Sorry, my screen froze earlier, Rob. I just wanna say, I, I agree with everyone else. It's just it's fine. Great. Um, definitely a consensus then. Uh, and in that case, I think it's worth looking at a resolution. Lisa, you said you might be able to dig one up. Yeah, I thought I had written one before, but I didn't. Um, so I don't have a resolution for you. Um, what it would say if I had one would be that, you know, they are requesting you, you approve this particular project on this date. 
they are requesting changes to the materials and then it would describe the way um, the materials are changing and it would reference a drawing showing those changes. So given that the drawing doesn't really exist and the resolution doesn't really exist, I question the wisdom of taking a vote on a resolution that doesn't exist, referencing a drawing that doesn't exist. Um, you know, I, it, it sounds pretty baked. I think, I think, you know, we support the changes, but I just, I don't think it makes sense for us to, to take an action on this today. Uh, so I appreciate so, you bringing it to us, Patrick, but I don't think we can do anything with it yet. True. So if you can submit those things, you know, we have the letter, if you can submit a revised, revised elevation key to the materials showing where exactly everything is, then it should be a pretty quick um, item for next month. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like we had the discussion. So, I mean, I, yeah. I think we can knock it out. Um, and I think that brings us to 510. Um, yeah, you got Brandon there as well. Brandon, do you want to take the lead to start? And I'll jump in. Um, well, where would we like to start? <laughs> I know we're going to review the part three, but do we want to discuss, um, I guess, any of the I guess I would prefer to answer any concerns or questions from the board um, that pertain to the part three. I mean, I know we submitted updated information to, um, you know, kind of help fill in the blanks that we had. Uh, I submitted a more comprehensive and updated set of drawings um, to Lisa for record, more or less covering everything that had been submitted previously. Um, so, you know, I guess that's, that's where we're at. Well, we do have the part three. I understand it's been updated significantly since the last one we saw. Yeah. And I understand that there's an additional update that we do not have on paper, but that exists digitally uh, that incorporates the letter you sent that we saw via email about basically what would happen if things popped up on a phase two when you had to mitigate, sort of what those mitigation strategies would be. Um, I found that letter to be fairly reasonable, um, you know, and, and it's in it's in a version of the part three. And when we get to that section, uh, I think we can bring that up. Um, so perhaps we work through it. Uh, it sounds like you don't have anything you necessarily want to present before we get into the part three in particular. Not necessarily, no. I mean, I, our, I think my biggest um, goal or object, objective for tonight is to make sure we, we can answer and, and, you know, kind of qualify everything we've submitted thus far, you know, so I, I'd leave it up to you guys to kind of uh, kick things at us and hopefully we can, we can resolve anything that we need to. Okay, so I think, I think we just need to focus on the document there. So then uh, everybody has, oh, Mitch. Maybe this will come up through the part three, but I was hoping we could spend some time talking about this sort of barrage of feedback we've been getting uh, from neighbors who are concerned about uh, the coordination, the communication, the impacts to their properties. I mean, we've, we've heard a lot now. And, I, and we heard from Patrick at PRC that things were cool and you were reaching out, but clearly there's two stories going on here. And I think we need to really get to the bottom of that. Uh, I agree. Um, so just for the benefit so that we're all on the same page, there does seem to be a real chorus from, you know, I want to say everybody to, that's adjacent to this site, but maybe everybody that's adjacent to the site, um, pretty, pretty upset. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's worth addressing, especially with as it relates to, to construction impacts. So, we sort of talked through the light and air stuff. I think we can open that up again if we want to, but the last time we talked through it, I think that there was a consensus on the board uh, that we were comfortable with the massing of the building and that we weren't gonna push on that. Um, but you know, I think, I think that there's things you can do and things that we could decide that we, that we need to see with respect to noise or vibration or construction hours or foundation strategies, whatever it ends up being, uh, that could make those, you know, construction impacts better or worse. And I think it'd be worth hearing from the applicant, you know, from your perspective, what, what do you guys want to see there? Sure. Well, I'll begin by saying that the two most critical comments that we've been getting are from the 
the owner of the duplex next door, Josh Adams, and then the only uh, homeowner on the block, Fred Petrilli, two doors down. Um, we've gotten fairly positive responses from, oh, I'm, I'm blanking on her name, but she owns a massage therapy office a couple blocks down. And um, she was very, like thankful with my, the transparency that I'd given all the construction information. And then the owner of 512 West State who had asked a question about the driveway between the two buildings, we agreed with, um, with them that we'll pave the full length of the driveway and they were satisfied, wished us good luck on the project. With Josh's letter, if I can be totally honest, I'm, I sometimes I can't tell how genuine they are um, because I had uh, spoken with, well, I sent him first the broad letter to all the neighbors listing out all the construction details that I was able to get a hold of from the project owners and from the architects. Um, and I said, I'm available by email or by phone, please reach out to me. Instead of reaching out to me, he sent an angry letter to the city saying that I was writing like a five-year-old that, oh, sorry, excuse me, like a fifth grader, uh, you know, just inflammatory language. And I reached out, I called him, left a voicemail and sent an email saying, hey, I'm available, let's talk. Like I'll answer what I'm able to answer. And if I don't have the answers, I'll be honest and say that somebody else above me, cause I'm an employee of the company, I'm not an owner. Like I can try to get the answer, but I'll be honest if I can't. Gave him plenty of answers. We had a little bit of back and forth about construction or acquisition price. If we were to try to buy him out, um, both Josh and Fred proposed purchase prices that would be like, if we were to acquire the third building over for free, then the project might break even if we were to do a redevelopment. So right now with the purchase prices that they've proposed, any redevelopment project on those two sites would generate a negative return. So that's kind of where the purchase negotiations are. So then with Josh, after our feedback and I made myself clearly available, said, please reach out to me by email or by phone. Then I learned uh, either yesterday or today that he sent another angrily worded email to the planning division. So I sent another email and saying, hey, I made myself available, let's talk. What are your remaining answers? Past few days have been busy, so I may have like not answered a few things. And we had another pretty cordial exchange this afternoon. So I, I, I don't know, I've made myself plenty available. I've been going to city hall meetings for about a third of my life. And sometimes I can tell when neighbors are saying things that makes it seem like they're trying to stall a project. And I can't tell sometimes how genuine questions are. For instance, two public private Oh, I, 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 th I think I need to stop you there. In fact, maybe I should have a while ago, um, because the back and forth between you and a particular neighbor isn't within our purview. Um, sort of a range of comments that are worried about the impacts of your building and the construction of your building are. Um, and, you know, regardless of your opinions on how genuine any individual neighbor might be like that's that's totally not our department and not necessarily appropriate uh for, for what we're talking about what is appropriate uh would be a discussion of what foundation of the system are you are you trying to settle on what are the impacts of that going to be what are you thinking about in terms of what you need in terms of construction hours um you know and 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 you know, in the absence of that, I think that you know, the board can just work through the part three and and you know make our best guesses. Well, we, um, but, I, Rob, if I can step in, I, I think we've provided that information in this part three in a fairly comprehensive manner at this point. Some of which has been existing in that part three for quite some time. Um, most recently, the change or addition, I should say, uh, is to the the inclusion of a potential for the CMC piles. Uh, which is a uh, controlled modulus column where they're drilled piles pumped with a, you know, basically a concrete slurry or, or grouted uh, as they drill back out the drill. Um, and Menard Group, uh, you know, they're the same outfit that's doing INHS. I think you all were familiar with that project and, and why that one particularly went the way that it did. Um, you know, I think we we're doing a lot uh, I think to accommodate or cater to the comments from one neighbor specifically. Um, and I think the part three covers some of the questions that you've raised, certainly from a working hours conditions. I don't think anything's being asked for in terms of working hours that goes above and beyond what the city requirements or allowances are or beyond what typical construction projects ask for. Um, 
you know, certainly with any construction project, there's going to be noise, there's going to be impacts, there's going to be debris. But I think to date, uh, we have now provided a majority of that that I hope would satisfy the board. And certainly if additional things are needed, we're, we're, we're on it. I mean, we are trying, we, you know, we really scrambled also just to get this CMC stuff uh, put together as quickly as we did. And I think the, the positive outcome of that is it looks like a really good potential uh, direction for us. Um, however, you know, as similarly stated in the previous project, you know, everybody is facing extreme budget concerns over material pricing, availabilities, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to where being, being that it's a new investigation for us, the, the team as a whole is not ready to fully commit um, to the CMC piles specifically. Um, but I do, I do have my, you know, I guess I'm, I'm hopeful that perhaps we, it, it is found that that is the most um, beneficial path. Um, but for now, we certainly, we have two, we have two pile systems designed, I guess, for the project that will work. One being the steel, you know, steel piles driven um, and the CNC option, which as we get a little further on in, in investigating it and, and having some team coordination meetings, that might become more of the winner in this. I think, I think people are hopeful for that, um, but just not quite ready to make that 100% commitment to it. So. Fair enough. Um, I appreciate you letting us know where you are there. Uh, I think at this point, the thing that makes sense is for the, the board to go through the document. Um, conveniently, the first section of the document is impact on land, and the highlight uh, is about you know foundations. Um, so, so quickly, I want to say, forgive me if the level of detail that I went into wasn't what the board requested. Um, I, yeah. No, I, I understand that you're in it, and you know, you're by virtue of being in it, you're going to have a very different perspective. I, I, I totally understand that. Um, so I'd open the floor to board members uh, or staff, uh, questions or perspectives on impact on land. And of course the highlight there is on um, foundation impacts. McKenzie. Um, yeah, this memo from David Elwin from EMP. Um, just making sure, you know, they say that they, to ensure like pre-surveys and post-surveys and whatnot, that they'll include it in there, that the bid specifications will have similar requirements. If whatever that final like documentation is of who's responsible, if it's EMP or if it's VISM or like who's, whoever's orchestrating it, both, I guess, I think that should be included as referenced in part three, Lisa, I think this. May so 14. just the, the normal language about, um, okay, reference that and say that, I mean, you could also say that you want them to provide you with the monitoring plan once it's ready. I think they did send us the monitoring plan already, which should also be part of the record, right? Or someone sent in this packet of emails from Brandon, there's the, I guess it's just the general, the general, it's the white paper, got it, not the- uh, Yeah, they don't have the monitor, they wouldn't right. have the specifications yeah. so on the that. Plan so the plan and- yeah, who's responsible for it. Let's just in include that, um, especially because there has been tension about the potential for nearby property damage. We we'll definitely want to leave a clear paper trail about who to, who to discuss that with should anything happen in the future. Um, but that's the only thing I have to say about that part. Great, thank you, McKenzie. Any other board members with questions or comments on the first section there? Opening it up to later sections. We have looked at this document before, but this is, I think, pretty considerably fleshed out since then. Um, and if at any point people feel like they need to see the section that incorporates the letter from VISM or from VISM's uh, consultant. I believe that's uh, the impact on human health section. I believe we have that digitally and can pull it up. Yeah, I'll, I'll add if I can, that, that document was provided by uh, Geologic, who is the company that also performed the phase one ESA. So, you know, I think uh, certainly familiarity and continuity with them is gonna be helpful. Uh, moving forward, 
I will say I feel comfortable with most of this part three as I as I as I look back through it. Um, the only thing I wish is I wish we were were settled on the less impactful foundation strategy. Um, and it's not like we can prescribe a strategy uh, at this stage, is, is my understanding, Garrick. Well, Rob, I'm, I'm, you know, maybe asking, looking to help from you or Lisa or anyone who knows the answer. But you know, in my recollection, you know, we've had pile drivings, but it's almost always been on a, a site that is not directly adjacent to people's homes. It's my recollection. Yeah. That's right. And, uh, you know, people were at least across the street. But, you know, you look at the, you know, the map from Mr. Piccarelli. I mean, this is like right on his property line. And, you know, if it was if someone proposed coming right to my property line and driving pylons for four months, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, it, it, it does make the home uninhabitable. And I don't know what's the resolution of that. I, I don't know if there's case law on that. I don't know. I, I don't really know kind of how to deal with it, but it, it, it seems like an unacceptable environmental externality. Uh, so I don't know what the solution is. If it's to put the neighbors in a hotel or temporary housing or, or you know, uh, especially with so many people working at home now, um, you know, I don't know, this, you know, it, but it, something's got to be done. And, and the answer that that construction costs are going up, while true, is really not I mean, our that's concern not the is the environmental concerns, impact. Right. That's not right? the board's concern. That's not our, right. that's sort of not our purview. Yeah. So, right. Right. yeah. So if I could, if I'll, I, I'd like to comment uh, on that, Garrick. So yeah, we, we don't bring that up to make that part of the board's concern. We make that, we bring that up to make that a point of the project uh, scenario as it, as it exists. But one of the things that, um, you know, you mentioned, yeah, it's on the property line, you know, to what extent, um, is far enough away from the property line acceptable to the board, to the neighbor, to whomever. Um, I mean, one of the one of the things that was written in in the one of the emails from Dave Elwin was, you know, if, if the board wanted to see some sort of revision where uh, driven piles specifically, if let's just say a determined path needed or wanted to be made, you know, tonight or whatever, sooner than later, let's say, um, to you know that because we know that the CMC piles can work um, to a degree, obviously it requires coordination and modification to the, to the actual foundation system itself and how it would integrate in with a driven pile system, essentially talking about going a hybrid style, right? Um, you know, so at what distance away from a property line does driving a pile become, um, uh, you know, okay or accepted by anybody, that being the board's opinions or the neighbor's opinions. Uh, you know, I don't know, um, that, that we would find a distance that we could put down on paper and say, if we're this far away, then we will drive piles or, or not. So, um, we're, this is where it's difficult for us too, because we are battling, uh, budget. And, uh, like I, I, I mentioned earlier, I think the hope is that the CMC piles will, will win out. I, you know, I'm hopeful of that. Um, some more time needs to be spent. We do have plans for a coordination meeting with the whole group and Menard group to get involved, um, you know, at, at that ground level to start hashing out real plans for that. Um, we're just not there yet. So can I, I mean, I mean, this, this, although it's new to this board, or at least it's new to me, um, I don't think it's a new problem in general. And, it, you know, I mean, people live in cities, there's noise in cities, there's disruptions, there's vibrations. And so sometimes, surely over the course of all, all this case law, there's been some establishment of what is sort of an acceptable disturbance that people just have to put up with as part of living in the city and what's an unacceptable disturbance that uh, the person creating the externality has to somehow compensate the neighbor for. And, you know, uh, noise can be measured in decibels and, and vibration can be measured in some units. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure the engineers know. So it seems like we ought to be able to go to a document that says, you know, in New York state case law, this is the acceptable level of noise and vibrations that neighbors have to just put up with as part of living in the city. And, and beyond that threshold, you know, there has to be some kind of a mutually agreed compensation or alternative arrangement. So I don't know what that is, but uh, it, could, could someone find that? I, so, I don't know. Yeah, it's not part of Seeker. I mean, Seeker is about, you know, that magnitude of the impact is about how many people are affected. So. That's not wouldn't be a seeker thing, but you know certainly the impact is real, and the and the um, and the 
this site is very unique in the way it goes through and in between different buildings. We haven't ever seen a project like this before, specifically. You know, so I find like, myself looking for the same things that I feel like Derek's looking for. Hmm. Um, I mean, yeah, and and yeah, maybe you could just expand on sort of the role of Seeger because I mean, because because Derek referenced case law a couple times. And I think that's interesting because sort of part of me goes, but wait, this is for the courts. This isn't for us. And of course that's where case, but you know, you say it's, it, so, so what, what, what does seeker say when there is a real impact, uh, you know, in a, in a potentially very significant impact, but only on a small group of people? Like, like, what does, what does that mean? Well, I mean, what, what I, I mean, I guess what I was saying is in terms of, you know, case law and, you know, I mean, um, you know, what Seeker would say is if you don't have enough information to determine an impact, you need to get more information. So if like, for instance, what Brandon was saying, what would be the distance that you, if you were gonna do a hybrid foundation system, for instance, what would be the correct distance between, you know, from a property line, you know, that would be a study, you know, if, if you were if you were going to propose a hybrid foundation, that would be a study to study that because you don't know that you can't we can't determine that we'd have to have somebody help us with that. Um, um, so, um, but yes, seeker is about magnitude, but it's not. Um, you know, you have to make the boat the you have to base your decision on what you know, or or if you don't know enough, you ask for more study on it. I guess it's just to understand when, when I talk about magnitude, I mean, if, if a construction worker is whistling while, while he works, that's a noise, but it has a yeah. minimal, you know, mid, mid, minimal uh, impact, right? right. Uh, it's a minimal magnitude of pylon driving is a large magnitude. And so, you know, if you talk about magnitudes of environmental impact, I think you need to quantify it with something. And so if it's, if it's not case law, then, then maybe the DEC has guidelines on what's acceptable noise pollution. I, I don't know. I just feel like I'm looking for some metric on it as opposed to just a kind of hand wavy qualitative thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in Seeker, you look at time, duration, magnitude, you know, so, but, but again, I think this is a really unique site. We haven't again seen a site like this that is so close to other buildings where a pile foundation is needed. One thing that the project team is definitely open to is, uh, if it takes a bit longer to put the foundations in the ground, like by doing reduced hours during the day, like we're happy to do that. I mean, I have to say from <laughs> just, I'm sorry that, you know, the Elwyn Palmer thing specifically said that the CMC was less impactful. They, they said it. They said it was for sure. In fact, yeah, nobody's nobody's denying. Nobody's that denying bad. that. So, so yeah, from the board, from a seeker perspective, from the board looking at impacts, you know, that's so, probably the way to go. I think is what Lisa's getting at. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, and, and, and to what extent are we even allowed to say that there's no impact if we, you know, have basically said in this meeting that there is an impact and it you know, has, yeah, I mean, that, that's where I'm at. That's where you go to, has the, as the app, has the, has the impact been mitigated to the maximum extent practicable? So, you know, that when is, of course, that is under one foundation strategy, it hasn't. Also, if I may, like to me, being able to mitigate it means being open to helping to fix something that goes wrong that we don't know about yet. And we don't, you know, like often our mitigations are very front loaded during construction, but what happens if a neighbor's foundation does crack during pile driving? We know, and, and we know that it does because there have been surveys before and after. Who, who is responsible for it? I think that's something that needs to be clearly stated. Worst case scenario, of course, but like, if we're talking about mitigations, then Right. That's the, so, that's the bottom side of that coin. I, I, so I have a few a few things to add to a couple of comments here that were made. So I'll I'll back I'll go backwards. I'll answer Mackenzie's first. Um, Dave's email does actually talk about the vibration monitoring and and visual both you know from a visual inspection before and after and throughout duration and so forth. And that um, you know damages 
incurred along that time frame, if there were to be any, that it would certainly be a you know the project um, owner developer, what if you will, uh, uh, need to rectify that, correct it, fix it, etc. Um, one of the interesting things that he did point out, and I forget if it was in the, the specific emails that I included there, if it was in a prior uh, discussion I had with Dave, but in other projects where they've done decimal rated readings throughout uh, pile driving uh, operations, and, and actually it was a downtown project, the highest decibel rating uh, that was recorded on site was actually put, uh, by a passing truck, um, not, not from the pile driving operation. Um, and I know a lot of the discussion here tonight is all about this proximity to neighbors and closest and stuff, but uh, I work on West State Street right across from the State Theater. And uh, when the pile driving was going on at the new library location, um, blocks away, um, you know, it was, it was impactful to us that far away. So I, I think to, to say that we are a unique situation we, where we will, are the only ones or the first ones in the city to have this kind of an impact on residential properties is, is really short-sighted and, and incorrect. There's, I'd, I'd argue that just about every pile driving operation that's occurred in the city has been impactful to neighboring um, properties. Now, granted to Garrett's point, maybe not on their property line, to, and maybe the maybe the concern here isn't so much the the noise impact of it if it's happening during the day. Although, like you said, people working from home, but perhaps it's vibratory concerns um, to where if you know if this is the path we go. And again, we're still talking hypotheticals to an extent because we haven't made that decision yet. Um, that you know, if a mitigation measure was you know, if let's say Fred being the one neighbor who, who has this concern because he does work from home and that would virtually make it a, a you know impossible task to, to achieve. If you know there was a, a way to provide him a working space during the during the construction hours that he could go to uh, perform those tasks. I don't know. I'm and I'm throwing this out there from the standpoint of saying, you know, I know you guys are talking like we are a unique site. Ironworks is literally 50 feet away from those same houses and they're doing, you know what I mean? It's, we are unique to an extent, but we are not creating new or unseen um, scenarios within the city itself in terms of foundation systems, so. And I'll also add that Ironworks also has a snaky, like three pointed shape, goes five stories of four from a CBD district down to B2D, but is double the number of units. And we're doing affordable housing, they're doing market rate. I think I think you guys are just making my point, which is that, yeah, there's noise in cities, there's disturbances in cities, and we need to quantify what those disturbances are and figure out what's sort of an acceptable and an unacceptable impact, environmental impact on neighbors, and then find a solution to it. So uh, yeah. Do we know, does the city have like a decibel level noise? About, I mean, I don't, you know, because I think one of the things that Dave said too, he goes, you know, all this happens within, because part of the reason I think they record decibel levels is to make sure that they're not exceeding uh, an accepted level. Um, I mean, if that, if that exists, maybe that's language that gets put in there that if a driven pile system goes in that the, that decibel levels have to be kept below um, a certain level or something. You know, I don't, I'm sure outfits that do this on a regular basis have ways to mitigate that component of their system to an, to an extent. I mean, I, I don't know because I'm not an expert in it, but um Maybe, I don't know, maybe that's a possible ad if that were to happen. I don't know. So I think it's worth taking a pause um, and going around the room and seeing where board members are in terms of this issue, the part three, uh, what, if anything, they'd want to see before taking a vote on a neg deck or whether they feel ready to take a vote on a neg deck. Um, Garrick, I feel like I, I get a sense where you stand, so I'm going to come to you last. Uh, and Emily, I would start with you. So I, I generally feel comfortable with the project as designed that the benefit, the long-term benefits after it's built outweigh, um, concerns. However, I'm not yet comfortable with this construction, uh, piece of it, the noise, the vibration. Um, I think it either has to be a study that that like quantifies as Garrick said or I read in one of the letters from a tenant that it was thrown out there maybe um 
like the owner developer subsidizes rent or like you said brandon provides a workspace and that would i don't think we can regulate that but i feel like I that we can in, in the absence of a of some study and some quantifiable numbers if the applicant brought some proposal like that forward that we could document that might you know offset some of the concerns um yeah elizabeth Um, I just wanted to say the same that I said before, I empathize with the neighbors, but they don't own the property next door. And I feel that no matter what kind of system is used, they will be impacted, period. Um, and they will complain just the same with um, either, uh, either um, system or foundation I don't think there's a way to mitigate it. And I, in 25 years of construction, you know, they've all complained and I've never had to uh, negotiate uh, temporary rental for any uh, neighbors. It's if, you know, if, if it bothers them, they can make those arrangements, but they don't own the property next door. And um, if the, contractor and the designer are meeting all state, federal, um, and local regulations, I, I honestly think that there, there is a neg, you know, this is a neg deck and people are gonna complain no matter what. Fair enough, thank you, Elizabeth. Mackenzie. Um, I think that there are probably some minimal mitigations we can do that we would often require. I mean, I, I think that providing some parking, you know, cornering some parking off or something, if construction parking is gonna limit certain things. I mean, I'm, I'm open to um, incorporating some mitigations like that, but they seem, but they're, they're, they're personnel involved. They're not related to construction. I think they're administrative. And so as Lisa pointed out, we can't really, we can't really police those. Um, I agree with Elizabeth that this is an urban environment and this, this building has merit. And even if it didn't have merit, it is, um, it's a, it's a legal building. Um, I'm aware that that might make me sound insensitive, but I feel especially like motivated to push affordable housing through in the city. Um, you know, especially for when we're getting letters from people who don't own, we, we haven't heard from tenants of the building that they're, that they're concerned. You know, we've heard from owners of the building. Um, and I think owners who I, I believe don't reside next door. Um, and it doesn't mean that they're, you know, those valids are, those concerns are obviously valid. And if they're, you know, like my, to my point before, if there is damage, I think there has to be some mechanism for people to recoup like those costs, that's only like the, the generous, you know, like good hearted thing to do. Um, and I want rec, I think we need to have a record of all of those, uh, you know, like the, the plan. And I think we, I think that the board can totally encourage you to go with whatever system we know the CMC system that's going to have less impact. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, I've, I've also been coming to city hall meetings for a significant portion of my life. And, um, and I do think that we often see um, a case of people's devotion to a place, allowing them to feel entitled to the surrounding environment. And uh, I think that this project is gonna be really good for the city. And um, I'd like to see some of those, um, you know, potential like MOUs or whatever might exist, um, but I'm not going to, hold up an egg deck for this like affordable infill development project. It's like a, it's a shoe in for me, so. Okay, thank you. Mitch. Uh, I, have, I have nothing to add here. Okay, so I am hearing a low, oh, Garrick, we'll come back to you. Oh, you're muted. So I, I've been wondering when uh, University of Chicago Nobel Prize winning economist Ronald Coase would come into the planning board, but he has come in now. 
So he did a, a lot of, of the pioneering work in law and economics on the resolution of externalities, right? So we have a, a property A that is going to uh, pursue a lawful development right and generate a negative externality to neighboring property B, right? So the question is, what are the property rights? So clearly, as Elizabeth pointed out, the construction is occurring on the applicant's property and the applicant has a right to do that construction, right? But the neighbor has a certain right to some peace and quiet on his property, right? And the sound waves are gonna to go to the neighbor's property. And so the question is, is it the property right of the developer to build the building or the property right of the neighbor to have reasonable peace and quiet on his property? Now, the idea that you can do anything on your property, irrespective of you know, the negative externalities on your neighbor, we all agree that's ridiculous because we readily accept, for example, that you can't drive pylons at 3 a.m. No one's proposing that you drive pylons at 3 a.m., but if you subscribe to the view that you can do anything you want on your property, then, then, then you wouldn't have a problem with that. So what we all acknowledge is that there's, there's some, you know, there's some you know, middle ground that the developer has a right to build, and that's not what neighbor, I said, Garrett. I didn't say you said that. I'm just saying, but you, you, nobody's saying that, which is, which, is, which is an indication that we all agree implicitly that there's some limit on the exercise of property rights. Of course, you didn't say that. No one would say that, right? But the fact that no one would say that is, is an implicit understanding that there, there are limits. And what I'm trying to get at is what is the middle ground there? You know, the, the neighbors have a certain right to, to some peace and quiet. The developer has a certain right to develop. And what we're looking for is sort of the, the, the median compromise. What I would like to hear from the applicant is, okay, this pylon system is going to generate this level of noise. And this, is it a Richter scale that's the vibration or this level of Richter scale? And you know, this, this is what it's going to be. And either they, the developer can say that falls below some established guidelines set by the DEC or case law or whatever, but the developer can make the case, the applicant can make the case that this level of noise and vibration is acceptable, see this regulation or see this case law, and I'll, then I will then gladly say you can go ahead, okay? Uh, but I think that's on the developer, not on us. Okay, alternatively, plan B for the developer is to privately work it out with the neighbors, in, in which case there's no one complaining. So, but either come to us with the regulation that says this is an acceptable level of noise and vibration, it must exist. It must, because this has happened thousands of times before. So either come to us with the regulation, you know, or the, the, the metric, this falls below the level that's allowed, or work it out with the neighbors. But, it, you know, kind of to shrug your shoulders is not enough for me. I hear that. Um, so I'm going to lean on Lisa pretty hard in terms of what I should do next. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to summarize what I feel like I've heard. I feel like I've heard a majority of the, of the majority of this board ready to vote for a neg deck today. Um, and I think that there's, you know, oh, Mackenzie. I'm in favor of voting for a neg deck, but I don't want to vote on it yet today because I think that there are still some discussions to be had. As Garrick said, there are like a couple of there are options that might be the developer bringing us more information, either about an agreement with the neighbor or existing research. Um, yeah, I, and I, I am generally in favor of a negative declaration, but I think we have to kind of like do our due diligence. And if this is a question that is that remains for members of the board and for members of the public, it seems fair for us to request that we get some information about it with the hope of coming to a neg deck. You know, like my hope is not to create more work and then say that we, we want to go through a three-year environmental impact statement or study or anything like that. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention is that, you know, I, I feel like the two sort of opposite poles to, to sort of unfairly put them that way is Garrick saying that we are reaching for a standard and Elizabeth saying that there is a standard and this meets the standard. And so it's a neg deck. Uh, and I, I kind of, you know, I, I, I can almost see both sides there. Uh, and so I would lean on Lisa and ask what are the reasonable ways forward? Right. So, I mean, I think it's really your job. Yes. Yes. There are standards. Yes. We have a noise ordinance. Yes. You know, all of this, but you know, it's really your job to look at the evidence that's been presented and determine if the applicant 
either you don't either the applicant has mitigated the impacts to this particular project to the maximum extent practicable, or you don't know yet if that's true, or you need more information to know. You're not geologists, you're not foundation specialists, Seeker doesn't require that. It just requires that you look at the evidence and determine, you know, based on reason, if that's true. So actually the kind of project it is, an affordable housing project should have no, no bearing on what on this, on this, or, you know, other things. It's just about the impacts. So, you know, what's practicable, you know? <laughs> another, so, so yes, we have standards, but things can still be impactful. Um, so if you, you could determine based on a reason argument that the standards that are in place are enough to mitigate the impact in this case, but not in another case or whatever. So that's really, you know, and, and it really doesn't get in too much into land use law because that's more of like a site plan thing, you know, like this is really about, you know, and, you know, the impact here as with all construction impacts is a temporary impact that plays a large part into your determination. Um, so, um, and, you know, how long is it going to be? How permanent is the impact? And, you know, how, um, how many people does it affect really is the you know, and that might be unique to each situation. Now, if, if your concern was that the building is too big, that's a permanent impact that has a bigger magnitude, you know, that's a different situation. So does that, is that helpful? I think so. I mean, I'll, I'll say yes, that, it, yeah. go, go ahead. I mean, I mean, again, it's like a reason you have to just reason through it and consider all the evidence. And that's all that Seeker asks of you. Um, so it's not that you have to, you know, so, you know, go ahead, Mackenzie. I think what's tricky to Lisa's point is that we're, you know, a lot of what we're dealing with is not like board generated um, issues with the design, but we're talking about neighbors. And like, while there is an impact on community character, there isn't really a just like flat out, do the, do the immediate neighbors like this project or not, you know? And so we kind of have to address it through other areas, through the mitigations. And so I think that's why like, if, if you can come if you come up with a parking agreement, you know, for the neighbor who's concerned about his tenants parking, I feel like that's right. I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not requesting like a, an independent study. I think Garrick's point about wanting some evidence about thresholds is fair. Um, and I also feel like none of us own the sunlight and it, I'm, I feel called to say that we're all on stolen land in the first place anyway. So some of this quibbling about like, you know, pile driving and whatnot feels, um, it just, it feels incredibly privileged, I suppose. Um, which it is, right? We're talking about ownership, home ownership in the city of Ithaca. That's privilege. Development, being a developer in the city of Ithaca, that's privilege. Like, I just want to be really sensitive to these, to these issues. And so if Lisa, while like affordability might not have anything to do with it, it does have something to do with it. Because a lot of people are building buildings that aren't meant to be affordable to like improve the quality of life for people in the city who don't have access to that other ways. I just, I don't see any, I, I can't see all these things as separate and there isn't, you know, Seeker doesn't talk about these social things. And I feel like we have, we, we have to talk about them. We have to bring them up. Um, but I feel like if, if we have like construction information about parking, you know, that's kind of like where I'm at. To make Malia, sure that I saw a hand. Oh, sorry, Mackenzie. Um, I'm wondering if we'll find out about the CMC in six months. Is it a cost problem? You know, I feel like this would be a slam dunk if the applicant would commit to the CMC now. It would be a very easy nag deck for me. And it sounds like the applicant's just not there yet. Yeah, I, I'm not. I I can speak from the architectural side of things that I am I am not at liberty to make that decision tonight. I don't know, Patrick would be either but um i you know i certainly understand there's a lot of irony in this conversation happening right now which is um uh, well it's, i hear you it's ironic <laughs> um so i i want to come back to garrick's comment um but first i think i want to go just around the room and have a really just super quick straw poll uh you know about just the question that lisa raised which is are the impacts mitigated to what you would consider as an individual board member, the 
maximum extent practicable? And do you need to see anything else to know that? I mean, so it's just really those questions. Right. Uh, um, and, I, and I think I just, I think for me to be able to do my job as chair at this point, I just need to know where everybody on the board stands on those two questions. And right now I, I know it for maybe three people. Um, so Garrick, I feel like I know it for you, but I'm gonna start with you anyway. Oh, I think you said it well, Rob. I mean, that's, that's what I want. I just feel like right now we don't have the information. And yeah. so by next month, if we have the information, how much noise, how much vibration, is it a reasonable amount or not? Can there be an accommodation made with the neighbor? If that's fully fleshed out to the maximum extent, then I'm on board for this project. I support this project. I want this to move forward. I just don't think we have all the information we need. And I don't think it's okay for the neighbors to just, you know, let this, you know, for the sake of the neighbors, let, let this move forward without getting full information. Um, the one other thing I'd say is that, uh, you know, a, as much as I and everyone else is in favor of affordable housing, I don't think the environmental stand, standard changes because the, the project being built includes affordable housing. I think it's the same standard, irregardless of what's being built, whether it's market rate or affordable. Thank you, Garrick. Emily? I'd agree with Garrick. Um, more information next time on the noise and vibration. Okay. Uh, thank you, Emily. Elizabeth? Uh, given what I've seen so far and what I know about building code standards and um, environmental standards and municipal standards, I think they are well within um, a neg deck. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, McKinsey. 99% ready to vote on a neg deck. And I think the specific further information that we need would be what Garrick suggested around um, thresholds for vibrations and whatnot being right next door. And um, more information about choosing CMC or not. I mean, I think as much as the sooner we can get a commitment to that, the sooner I think we can um, we can feel as if this was mitigated properly. Thank you, Mackenzie. Mitch. Yeah, agreed. Need more need more info um, before deciding whether it's mitigated to the extent practical, and a comparison between CMC and conventional pile driving and the thresholds for each and um, what they're able to do. Okay. So with that, I definitely not calling for a vote on a neg deck tonight. Um, we've also spent way more time on this project than we said we were going to per the agenda. So I want to circle back with Lisa again and just say, what do we want to make sure we look at before we let the applicant go today? Well, I think that um, you've given them some direction about what to provide for next month. We can update the part three based on the information they provided um, today and yesterday. And I don't, I think that that's fine. I don't think we need to look at anything else. I can't identify anything else. No, I, I did not. And anybody else? Yeah. BZA? Uh, well, they won't go to BZA until they get a NIC deck. So. Right, right. Got it. But we um, can't recommend it anyway. I mean, uh, I mean, I wouldn't uh, yeah. from a procedural point of view. Okay. So we'll, we'll handle that uh, presumably next month. If we do the next deck month, month, month. I'll say personally that uh, Elizabeth eventually convinced me. Uh, you know, I trust her professional judgment. So I probably would have voted um, next deck tonight, but I feel relieved that we're going to have more information to look at. And I, I think we'll be able to make a, a more full, fully, you know, knowledgeable decision. Uh, and Emily, I saw your hand. I just put a document in chat that I was sent um, from the DEC on noise regulations. Oh, thank so you. I haven't, I haven't fully read it, but um, I think I will for next time. And um, yeah, that's all from the DEC. So maybe and the applicant should as well. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for sharing that. Garrick, I saw your hand. I just point out that Elizabeth may be entirely correct. Uh, and so then it's just a matter of if whoever knows the answer, bring back the document that says she's correct, then I will. Uh, uh, gladly admit that that she was right. You're here. Um, no, I mean, and I, I feel I feel pretty similarly. I, I do feel a, a sense of relief not having to vote on this tonight, not knowing what I don't know. Um, so, Lisa. Yeah, I just want to say that I, you know, I know this is probably disappointing for the applicant, but just you know, I think everybody should remember that we all have the same goal, right? To to eventually do a neg deck based on a solid argument and if there's doubt then that is you know that affects the you know that could affect the um 
you know, the reasoning. So I think that we all want the same thing. We want a solid neg deck to stand on. So. I, I agree. Um, with that, I think that's it for this project tonight. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you all. Have a good evening. You too. Okay, so we are 30 minutes behind. We were ahead. I know. No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I shared a lot of those concerns and it was a worthwhile discussion. So here we are. Um, 405 Elmira Road. So I will say this, um, this DEC document on noise, it gives specific thresholds and decibel levels. Um, so that's all in a quick scan. This might be what we need. Thank you very much for that, Emily. You folks hear me okay? We can. Uh, looks Great. like there's a big crew here. Is there anyone in particular that we're not seeing that we should be waiting for? No, I don't think so. I think Heinrich Fisher uh, is on for the next project, um, which is fine. Uh, but here tonight, we're here to talk about the KFC project at 405 Elmira Road. Uh, quick updates uh, based on feedback from the PRC committee meeting there we had on the 11th. Um, and uh, Rich Wilkinson will give us some updates on the building facade here. Uh, because we were asked to discuss and possibly consider some alternatives to the EFIS uh, that was uh, basically you know, discussed and, and kind of agreed upon in the early stages of the planning board uh, review. Um, quick updates on the site side. Uh, Lisa, I, I will acknowledge that I, I did not get the tree, the, the suggested tree planting on the, let's see, the southwest side of uh, the plan incorporated into the submission that we sent in, but they have been added. Uh, so we just added some uh, uh, landscape planter areas with two, uh, I believe, red maple trees in there, um, resulted in a net zero change in the, in the provided parking. Um, so that's that's in there. That's part of the plan set now. Um, the patio, uh, I believe we talked about that at the PRC meeting. The patio does have a railing around it, um, and really, you know, on the site side, there've been minimal changes since since we last uh, spoke. On the sidewalk side, uh, if you recall the sidewalk extension out to the south, um, uh, just a quick reminder, that's on state park land. We have engaged state parks over the last month or month and a half. Uh, this Friday, they are supposed to be talking internally with their council on how they're, they're in favor of it, okay? They, they just wanna figure out a way to ensure maintenance of it because they don't, they don't wanna have to take care of it. So whether it's gonna be an easement to, to the applicant or possibly if the preference for them is to have the city take care of it because it connects to the city right of way, then you know, that's, a, that's a separate conversation I have to have with um, streets and sidewalks and then state parks. So as of Friday, we should have a direction as to which way they wanna go for sidewalk maintenance. Um, and that's really, that's really it on the site side. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, any further updates? I know that there was discussion in PRC of possibly uh, looking at materials or um, I don't remember exactly where we with, left that, but the, you know, Mitch brought up some aesthetic concerns and uh, I believe the applicant was open to those concerns. Yeah, I, um, I have submitted the samples uh, to the city of the, the, the different color ephuses and uh, that we currently use on our buildings. Um, I did review the comment on the uh, building in Ohio. Uh, that building's like 30 years old, so it's uh, a, a very old look um, that does have some uh, brick to it and EFIS uh, mix. Um, it's, it's something that we've moved away from as a uh, company for branding purposes. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm open to some suggestions if, if there's an issue, uh, but we'd like to keep our branding the way we discussed it in the, the first 
meetings that we had, uh, if possible. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, do want to say for the benefit of those who were not at PRC, uh, Mitch reopened the sort of facade as a topic of discussion and, and was having second thoughts uh, on the direction of that facade uh, with the, the powerful brand statement with the red and white EFIS um, and mentioned uh, a particular KFC that he had seen while traveling. And we discussed uh, that with the applicant. Um, and I don't know to what extent we're, we're looking to reopen that conversation today. We don't have any action on this project today other than a BZA rec. So it's not, you know, a problem if we take a, a couple minutes and, and talk about uh, to what extent we want to reopen things uh, on that. And Mitch, uh, I would turn it over to you if, you, if you'd like that, uh, to talk a little bit about your thoughts there. Yeah, I mean, I think you framed it properly. Um, that's what I had seen. And that's what I had reflected on when I was in vacation in Cleveland. And the sense that they have a situation um, in a village called North Olmstead that's very similar to Elmira Road. It's, it's auto oriented, um, but I think, you know, whether it's 30 years ago or, you know, a year ago, they seem to, for some buildings, have it adhered to uh, a more traditional style of architecture that I think creates a different character on that road um, that downplays the, the sort of prim primacy of the automobile, makes it a little bit softer, I you know, and what I said at PRC was that we as a board spend a lot of time talking about the details of facades of buildings on Elmira Road, you know, the, the um, projects that we look at. And I just feel like we've, we've kind of, I don't know how it was phrased in the notes, but that was, that was right, that we had sort of given up on this one maybe too quickly. And I know Garrick had mentioned it early on and, you know, I'm guilty of that as well of just saying like, yeah, this is the brand, this is the building we get. But I feel just like in a place like Ithaca that maybe we should just take another look at it. And, and that's what I was really asking um, the applicant and perhaps the board colleagues to do. Okay. Thank you for that, Mitch. Um, so, I mean, I, I think we could do that. I think that's, that that's, that's within our purview. Uh, I'll say, just personally, I, I'm a little reluctant to do that. I feel like we we gave a sort of set of feedback and picked a direction, and we've gone down the process, and we're you know a lot further down like down the process. And you know, I I, I don't have a huge appetite for for revisiting the facade. My thoughts are, are what they were then, um, but I, I mean, we can do that. And I think if the board wants to, you know, we should we should talk about that. Uh, and I think it's worth just going around the room and sort of getting a sense uh, of, of where people are. And Emily, since you're at the top of my screen, I'd start with you. Sure, I feel good still about um, the EFIS and the colors. I haven't um, seen the product samples yet. I will make sure to do that um, before the next PRC. But I agree with Mitch that we do spend a lot of time, especially when we get a building with a lot of a high percentage of EFIS, we spend a lot of time looking at the details to try to make sure where the panels meet is detailed well, where the, the roof coping is detailed well. And I was looking for that in this packet today um, and I see more site details. So I feel comfortable moving forward if we can see more details um, on the building exterior, perhaps next time. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Elizabeth. Yeah, I think I agree with what our uh, board colleagues have said so far. Um, although I do feel that I'm ready to approve this. Uh, I, Mitch, what specifically would you like to see different? Well, I mean, I think a building that's more sensitive to uh, architectural styles, more brick, more masonry, uh, less screaming kfc <laughs> frankly um but uh, i'm interested in these in these thoughts so let's keep keep going around the room thank you elizabeth uh, mckenzie um yeah thanks mitch for bringing it up like i don't think that we should ever be afraid of talking about the, you know like reopening conversations i think it's really important that we do it um that being said i'm actually like uh 
I'm okay. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't block moving forward if, you know, I also would appreciate seeing some of these details that like Mitch and Emily are discussing, but this is a, it's, you know, it's, it's a, a tight commercial area already, like in a commercial part of town and there are chains already and like, it might not be like the, the most perfect vision that we have of Ithaca and, um, you know, I mean, I think as, as planners, we have to be kind of realistic about like, yeah, it looks like a KFC. It is a KFC. They're coming here because they've probably done the market research to know that people are going to like it and want to look at it and go there. And that matters, I guess. Um, that matters to me. And um, I mean, it would be awesome if there was masonry. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like there are definitely materials that we could explore that would um kind of lift up the like the quality of the building but I'm not I'm not attached to it um yeah thank you Mackenzie uh Garrick sorry I've got too many screens I need to I need to make sure this uh zoom is highlighted before I get the space bar um, I don't know what to say. Uh, you know, the, the design came, it looked to me like too much like a, like a bucket of chicken. And so I suggested that we tone it down. And then I think it was Emily and others who have much better design sense than I do said, oh, you know, you're too old. And you don't see the fun and whimsy in this and, 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 and let, it, let it go and just have, just have fun with it. And so I accepted that because they have better taste than I do. And, and now Mitch is bringing it up again. And so I don't know, I guess like I was okay you know, after, after it was pointed out that I had no sense, you know, didn't have much sense of humor. I guess I was okay with the red and white striping just so long it was, it was you know, done at the high, you know, at a relatively high quality level. And then you get into, well, what, what defines high quality of materiality for IFAS on a building like this? And I defer again to Mitch and Emily because they're architects and I'm not. Um, so I don't really know where to go on that. I, I think I'm, I, I, think, I think I stand with, I was, I, I made my point, I was corrected and I think I'm okay with that. Um, I mean, the only thing I would say is just to be fair, um, I said the same thing with Texas Roadhouse. And, you know, and I said, you know, is it appropriate to have in Ethica in terms of character of neighborhood to the extent that you can call Route 13 character of, any, you know, of anything, is it appropriate to have a ranch, you know, uh, flying a Texas flag? And what the board said is that uh, it's a, okay to have a ranch as long as it had a sidewalk to the street and, you know, sort of a we met the design guidelines that we were okay with the ranch house. So I guess if we're okay with the ranch house, I mean, to be consistent, I think we're okay with the big bucket of chicken. So I, I leave it there. Garrick's on fire tonight. Um, and I, I think I agree with the ranch house analogy, uh, just personally, I, I buy it. Um, and I think that taking a look at architectural details on EFIS, you know, is something we should do uh, with this project. Uh, and I think that that's something I would lean on Emily and Mitch to help me understand what in particular we need, because I'll say that I don't. Um, and yeah, that's where I'm at. I'm, 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 I'm down with the fun and whimsy. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with the color scheme and the general strategy. Um, but I think having a clear understanding of the details uh, and how the materials are interfacing with one another uh, would be a way for us to, you know, take a look at building quality and hold that standard. Uh, and so I would go back to Emily and Mitch and ask them in particular what we should be looking for there. Um, I would suggest looking at a detail of how the building interfaces with the ground. There's going to be splashback of water onto EFIS. We've talked about cleaning before, so I think the detail at the base is important. Um, a detail at, I can't remember if there's any horizontal coping or maybe it's all vertical, but at a windowsill, at a window head. You know, I think cheaper buildings, cheaper building materials tend to have a very coplanar window and wall system. And so when you start to get relief of windows inset um, and more detail at the jam, it appears like a more high quality building. Um, and then maybe at the top to round it out, the coping, how is the top finished off? What is the detail to cap the EFIS? Um, yeah. So I'm gonna ask the applicant if you caught all that and if that's something that you feel like we could look at next month. 
Um, yeah, I can pull all those. We've submitted a full set of architectural plans. They're in for review with the building department now, uh, based on the original meeting that we had a, a couple of months ago. Um, so all of those details are part of the plans. Um, uh, I, I notice everybody keeps referring to EFIS as a panelized system. This is not panelized EFIS. This is a field applied EFIS. So there are no, uh, I'll call it breaks between panels or breaks between colors. It's a color impregnated uh, surface and it's all one smooth surface. Now there is some uh, uh, differentiation on some of the panels and they're scored a little bit differently. Uh, but overall, it is a uh, very serviceable face um, uh, from both the ground level and the upper levels. And then at the top, it's, it, it, it's a simple uh, uh, U-channel uh, coping across the top that leaves very little um, uh, view. It's, a, it's about a three-inch return down the uh, front face of the building. So... Um, yeah, I can, I can get you whatever details you'd like uh, off those plans uh, and submit them separately to you. Uh, I, I, I wrote down some notes of what you're looking for, the windows, the doors, the bottom, the top. So uh, I can pull those details and put them together for you. Great. We'll take a look at those, and I appreciate you putting that together. McKenzie. Yep. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure that you saw the city foresters note about use, um, choosing a tree species that is more drought resistant than red maple. I have not seen that, but if you want to afford it to us, we can certainly take a look at it. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. And and Garrick, not to belabor the point, but I I I do remember that I put up a big fuss about Texas Roadhouse because of this wall. They needed a wall, and it was in this weird place. And I also remember having lots and lots and lots of discussions about how to make the Marriott more. Ithaca centric and we, you know, it whittled down to the curtains and the windows. Like at a certain point, we uh, are, we are limited <laughs> in what we can request of people who, you know, own space and want to build buildings. <laughs> All right. Well, that... I, I think the, I would just say this, that, that um, I mean, I think we did distinguish between the entrance to the commons being more central to the sort of the, the, the theme and, and identity of Ethica than Route 13 is my recollection. Perhaps. Um, I think that that brings us to the BZA recommendation for this project. Um, so as I recall, the variance focuses on the front yard setback and is needed because of the way the land, the turn in lanes route to multiple retail uses there. Is that, is that a fair encapsulation? Correct. There's a minimum and maximum allowable building setback, and we can't comply with it, like you're saying, because of the shared entrance coming in off of 13. So to me, that's cut and dry, and we can just say that. Uh, what, if anything else, do we want to say? It, it, we also have a parking variance. Oh, I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. Uh, with that, we generally support... Um, <clears throat> You know, we generally support parking variances uh, to reduce dependence on cars and move towards, uh, you know, a less car-centric city. Is there anything else we want to say on the parking variance, McKinsey? But this is in a location with ample available parking. Available parking. Right, let's say that, Emily. And that the applicant um, is adding outdoor space. At the yeah. planning board request. Right. Yep. Okay. I think that's excellent. Uh, Lisa, is there anything else we need to cover in our BZA recommendations on this? No, I think that's fine. Okay. It's just to cap make sure we're capturing all the variances. It's the off-street parking, the building frontage, that's the one we haven't talked about, in addition to the setback, and then the setback. So it's those are the three. Building right. frontage, I'm going to assume that the reasons are the same as for the setback? Correct. Yeah, I, I think we just address it the same way. It's just okay. existing conditions and. Anything else from any member of board or staff on this project? All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Okay, thank you.
So Mackenzie, uh, have you uh, checked out the, the curtains in the Marriott? Are there are they still the uh, descending shade of blue? Um, I haven't checked recently. Um, there, there were some blue and white. There was, there was an attempt. I'll say there was an attempt. I don't know what it looks like now. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, they, they had proposed a cascading uh, thing of LED lights to come down the corner of the building to, to mimic uh, at the falls in the area. And then they value engineered that out. And then there was an attempt. I think it was John Schroeder who suggested that they vary the color of blue in the curtains from the top of the building to the bottom of the building to mimic the fall of water uh, in the curtains as they pressed up against the, the outside windows. I will say I've never caught that in person, but now I'm going to go look at the curtains. Yeah, go check it out. Um, that brings us to 228 Dryden Road. Is the I see a bunch of faces. Is, are, are the applicants here? Maybe I see mostly names. Yes, Nathan with Holt is here. We've got Adam Fischel with Marathon as well. Um, Heinrich should be on and Steve Hugo with Holt should be here as well. Excellent. So I think the plan for this project today is to have a short present. Well, no, have the full design review presentation. Um, do the public hearing, which for reasons of distribution may not count as an official public hearing. Uh, and then move into design review comments from the board and have that back and forth. Um, so if you would, please take it away with the presentation. Okay, let me make sure I'm sharing the correct screen here. I'm assuming everybody can see that. Yes. Okay, to give you just kind of a quick um, refresher on where we are, we are 228 Dryden Road, which is essentially the intersection of Bryant and Dryden just outside of College Town. We are in a CR4 district. Um, this project has been before you guys already, so I think you've seen the building. Um, what I wanted to do today was kind of just update you a little bit on it, some of the changes that we made since the last time we met. Um, in terms of the building itself, the building has not really changed. There have not been you know, updates to the building itself. The biggest focus that we'd spent our time on was responding to some of the comments that we heard from the board last time in terms of the, um, the plantings and stuff out in the front. So what we've done in the front of the building is to uh, remove some of the grasses along the sidewalk, start to, to utilize more kind of vertical plantings um, in the way of these kind of pencil point junipers, they'll get to be, you know, six to eight feet tall and start to create kind of a little bit more verticality along the street edge there. Um, we reduced a little bit of kind of the concrete wall that's in here and added some more verticality there. Um, installed, you know, the purple piano, made sure that that is, you know, there. And then we've planted and what's shown here and what was submitted uh, as part of this package it looks a little bit more kind of refined um, but the actual intent would be something more like this, which would create a little bit more of kind of a, a natural um, infill with some hicks you, uh, and then it'll start to kind of drape over that concrete wall. Um, the concrete wall is the board form concrete, so it will have kind of that, that board texture to it. It's not going to be just a flat concrete, um, so it will have kind of the graining and stuff to it. Um, Really, that is the biggest update. I mean, we're still um, basement plus four stories, 40 units. Um, we did supply the uh, building layout so you can kind of get a sense of how those studio units are laid out. Um, they're focused pretty much north and south. Um, we don't have any openings on the east side and the west side, which would be facing the two adjacent properties, uh, mostly because we're utilizing the row house um, aesthetic in there and kind of up against that property line on both sides. Um, so all of our kind of views are looking north and south in there. The There was a question last time about the sidewalk, um, the sidewalk width. Um, right now it is very narrow um, along the street. You can kind of see just to the west. It's about a five foot sidewalk. And what we've done to kind of relieve that pressure as, you know, we are at the intersection of Bryant and 228. And so what we've done to relieve that pressure is actually pulled the wall back and created these, these uh, bench seating spaces. So the sidewalk width in the public space has gone from about five feet up to nine foot, six, 10 foot at its widest up here to about eight foot at kind of its narrowest. So 
you know, that public realm, we've kind of expanded and provided moments where people, you know, walking along Dryden can stop and sit on the benches. Um, people can be waiting for uh, tenants of the building. Um, there is um, additional kind of, this is tenant patio space um, out front. I don't know if you can really see it, but, you know, there is kind of seating and, you know, outdoor shared space for the tenants um, up on this patio. And then the, the bottom units have their their own um, patio spaces. So I think the, the biggest um, modifications we've made since the last time we talked was really on the planting and trying to utilize what limited space we have because of grade and how we have to get up into the units and around the front of the site um, to create a little bit more kind of verticality and interest in, in some of the planting that's there. Um, is there, any, I, I guess at that point, th that's the update you know, since the last time we've talked, I'm open to answering any questions that you may have. Um, Thanks. I think we'll pause it there uh, and I'll ask you to, to stop sharing. We'll probably have you share again after public hearing. Um, and Lisa, I know it's going to be a little different um, for a distribution snafu, but um, we are going to not move public hearing we are instead just going to open up public comment and then comments from members of the public will be entered into the record as normal, but it won't be an official public hearing. We'll do an official public hearing next month. Did I get that correct? You got that correct. It's just not, yeah. yeah. So right. I don't, yeah, and I don't remember, Anya, is there anybody? Um, yeah. yeah, we we had had uh, the pastor of a nearby church. Oh, um, yeah. She was here for a while and now she doesn't seem to be here, but we did receive comments from, uh, a representative of the church yep. um, and they were worried about vibration monitoring. I uh, submitted those. I distributed them to the group ahead of time. I don't know. I think you have them. If you don't, I can print them. If you guys want to read them or you want me to read them, I can read them right now. I think we have them. Uh, have was, there, them. was there a request for them to be read? No, um, okay. not in particular. So there's no one here to speak for public comment and there's no thing that has been requested to be read. Do I, do I understand that correctly? That is true. Oh, there was one other comment that I had also distributed. I think that everybody has received this, but I'm going to, I'm just going to send them out to everybody in the group so that the applicants also have them. Um, one was from a neighbor's lawyer named Desare or Desare, who is concerned about a retaining wall. And I'll just send those out to the group right now. So that just to be sure everybody has them. Although I did email them before this um, meeting. Thank That's you very much. The left side of the property, correct? That's the sorry. Uh, uh, Anya, the retaining wall that you're referring to is the one on the west side of the property, correct? Is that the one? I think it so. Would be, it would be to the west, yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so since there's nobody here to speak and there's no comments requested to be read, there's not much of a public hearing that doesn't exist as a public hearing, so that's fine. I think it's reasonable to just move straight into design review. Uh, I'm going to open up the floor for questions from members of the board, comments, uh, and then, you know, uh, if we need to, we can we can ask the applicant to share their, their presentation again so we can dive sure. into that. Um, and if there's no questions or comments, I'm just going to go around the room. Okay, Elizabeth, could I start with you? Sure. I really like the changes. I think the benches are a great addition. Um, the rendering looks great. Thank you. Uh, Mackenzie. I also think it's a really handsome building. Um, I'm looking right now, but it'll probably be faster if you can point out for me the bicycle parking and at which entrance. Yep. So the, the bicycle parking for the tenants actually will be internal. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're going to have a storage room for bikes inside the building. With an easy way to get in or out or up or down. Or yep. Okay. Yeah, it'll all be visitor yeah. bike parking? Uh, visitor bike parking, we can accommodate probably on that upper tier level here. It, it's not shown now, but we will accommodate. I don't think we can see your screen if you're intending for yeah. us to be able to do so. Let me do that. I apologize. No worries. Mm -hmm. It occurred to me that you were showing us things. Yeah, so I'm, here I am pointing on the screen, assuming you guys can see it. Um, yeah, so I'm assuming on this on this upper tier here, we can accommodate you know some sort of uh, bike parking at this point. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Mackenzie. Uh, Garrick. Yeah, I think it's a great addition. Um, 
so I really like this. I think it's a very attractive design, very appropriate for the location. Uh, seems like based on some uh, recent sales of neighboring properties, this is the hot area. So a good place, a good place to invest. Um, so I'm all for it. Uh, I think the only question I had is I, I'd asked last time, I was just confused on the calculation of square footage. And yep. I got asked if we could just resolve my confusion on that. But other than that, yeah, full speed ahead. So the, and with regard to the square footage, the basement square footage is about 4,100 gross square feet. Um, if you can, let's see. So the, the basement floor is about 4,100 square feet. It's kind of built into the hillside and kind of the backside. So all of our units are facing out to the south and we've embedded kind of the mechanical spaces and storage and trash and sprinkler and stuff in there. That's about 4,100 square feet. The upper floors um, typical is about 5,200 square feet up there. So it totals out at about 24,900 gross square feet for the entire building. And there's four floors at the 5,200 square feet, one floor at the 4,100 square feet. So I'm just confused because I, I thought that if it's 0.185 acres, that's 8,000 square feet. So at CR4, 50% lock coverage, wouldn't each floor be limited to, to 4,000, not 5,200? Well, we will be seeking a an area variance. Ah, uh, yes. that okay. So that's the piece. So. I didn't, put, I didn't put that together. I'm sorry. Yep. Nope. And ex that's exactly it. So our rear yard right now will be extending into the rear yard. So two variances that we'll be attend or we'll be pursuing with BZA are a rear yard variance and a lot area variance. Um, the current building right now um, sits about, I think we cited about four foot off the 4.7 feet off the rear property line. Our building right now, the face of the envelope of the building is eight feet. So we're pulling the building back from where the existing building is currently on the site. Um, but we actually will, our balconies, which is on the upper floors, um, sorry, this is the first floor, but there are balconies on the, on the upper floors of two, three, and four. Those will effectively be five foot off the rear property line and they will align no closer than uh, the Lux next door in there. And then our, you know, total lot coverage will be um, about 66%. Thank you for explaining that. That, that. That's why I was confused. It makes total yep. sense. Good. Mitch. Uh, yeah, it looks good. Thanks for addressing the landscape in the front. Um, I mean, personally, I feel like you could go a step further and, and really. I think you dropped out. I was wondering if whether it was him or me. Let's give him a second. Hmm. It's like that yeah. anticipation. You could go a step further. <laughs> Try turning off your camera, Mitch. <laughs> <image. laughs> All right, we can come back to him. Um, Emily, I'm going to move on to you. Sure. Um, I think this looks great. The material uh, basis of design you sent um, is exciting. And I think the, it's a really smart move to pull back that retaining wall in front to give relief to the sidewalk. Um, so I think all your changes have been uh, good for this week. I really want to see. I really want to see the, the neighboring properties. In the back of your packet, there's some sections and I'm starting to understand that there's like maybe 10 or 15 feet between the building behind you. Um, so I just am excited to see what the other sides look like. I feel like we've been getting the front view for a while, which is great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, that's what I would look for next time. Yeah, you can see the adjacent building here. Sorry, Emily, uh, Emily. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say that's what I'm looking at at home too. That sheet. Yeah. And I feel like it's hard to. I mean, I see the, I see the section through the building, but if if you can, I don't know, give us more information um, than the outline in some way. I don't know if it's a rendering or or a bird's eye view or something to really understand maybe in 3D how those buildings interact. Go ahead. Steve. Okay. 
Yeah, that's uh, well. That's what I was about to ask. Are you are you imagining um, a site a site plan? But I'm guessing maybe a site plan that shows the outline of the other buildings and dimensions their proximity, and then some site sections for with something like that. Seem right? I think that would help. Yeah, I mean, we we start to see it here. If I'm the only one that is missing the picture, let me know. But um, you're not. That that's a great place yeah, to dive in. I think that's great. Yeah. That sounds good. Thanks, Emily. Uh, CJ, I realize that you just joined us, but if you're ready, uh, we're in design review for 228 Dryden Road, if you had any yeah. questions or comments. Um, yeah, you probably already covered this, but uh, really appreciate the inclusion of the funky piano for scale. It's uh, just clever. And uh, the project, uh, project is really great. Um, I concur with Emily. Um, about uh, looking for that 3D view. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks, CJ. Uh, Elizabeth. She might have stepped away for a second, which is fine. Uh, I'll say from my piece, uh, I think it's an attractive building. Uh, I think it works. We've talked about the design on this for a while, and I think it's come a long way. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it's a, it, it's, it's a nice, it's a nice fit. I think understanding the interactions with the adjacent buildings as Emily has requested makes a lot of sense. We should take a look at that and, uh, either 3d way or, or the, the site plan variations mentioned. Um, and then, uh, I think I want to check in with Lisa to see if there's anything we want to make sure we get at in this design review, because, um, if we, if there's not, we might be ready to wrap up for the day. Uh, yeah, I mean, normally in design review, we talk a lot about the materials and, you know, look at all the facades and the site and landscape, but I think, you know, it'll continue um, in future meetings, so. Yeah, I think I think we've given a direction where what we want to look at next, um, and I, we have talked about some of those things in, in, in prior meetings, so I feel a level of comfort, um, but I want to open it up to any members of staff or board. Uh, for any questions or comments or, or really anything that you want to make sure we look at, um, you know, in the, in the coming meetings, Lisa. Yeah, I do. I mean, I want to reiterate Mitch's since especially we heard that he lost power. That's why he's gone. Um, I do want to uh, reiterate his comment about really continuing to work on the landscape, because if you really think about, you know, this is going to feel like a lot of concrete on the streets. We really want to make sure that that really comes alive. And I want to say, I like those, um, you know, it's nice to have this landscaping on the street between the benches, but you're going to have to have a curb around that or some protection because people will just walk right over it and it'll be gone. So I know that's a tiny detail, but it yep. will make a big difference um, in how the building ends up looking. Um, yep, we appreciate detail. Yeah. All right. Any further questions or comments? Oh, I did want to say, um, the, um, Jean Grace did submit a comment that we'd like to have addressed for the net for as soon as possible really so we can put it into the seeker about you know the which we actually always ask for is the number and size of the trees to be removed and she said there was one very large tree on the site that was not slated for removal but probably that was an oversight because um, yeah, yeah it's a 48 inch dbh like in the northern section of the site okay We'll get you that list. Mitch is back with us. I want to turn it oh. over to him. Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, I was just going to comment on, you know, if there was the possibility to do some climbing vines on the walls because it still looks, you know, pretty solid base that the building is sitting on. I, like I said, I, I appreciated the extent that you did add landscape and I really like that part of it. But keep going if you can, you know, add add green grids to those walls and have vines climbing up them so that the appearance is that this building sits on a green plinth and not just this big masonry um, composition. So that, that was the only comment, if you can. Okay, we'll see what we can do. Thanks. And I just right. wanted to echo oh. that the softer, softer plants, not just the vertical. It kind of, it makes it seem even taller. So softer plants all around, like the vines. All right. Anything else? 
Thank you very much for your time. We'll see Thank you, you very month. much. I appreciate it. Have Thanks, a good everyone. Night. Next up, we have the Cliff Street Retreat. It's a baby for everyone wants to see it. It's a baby. I don't. I don't want to um, interrupt, but um, Elizabeth said she's been going for a long time. She requested a short break. If that's oh. possible. Yeah, let's take five minutes. I think that's reasonable. Sorry. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, it's 8.38. Let's be back here at 8.43. Thank you very much. Yep.
When planning mode members are back, if you could just turn on your camera so I know you're here, I'll uh, get started when we have all the members back. Hey, Rob. How are you? Good. Good. I think there are parts of the city that lost power a few minutes ago. That's why people were dropping off. I dropped off. Yeah, we lost Mitch for a few minutes. Let's see who's in here now. Okay. I think I have, you also have your iPad in here. Do you need that or should I put you? Who's that me? It says iPad Lincoln. Uh, it should be off. Okay. It's on my email now. Do you still see it? Yeah. I'll just put it back in the waiting room. Darned iPad. <laughs> it's haunted. <laughs> it, is. it does whatever it wants. So we're a minute past when we said we'd be here. So, and we do have quorums. So we can go ahead and get started. Um, all we have to do today is declare lead agency. So it's not a heavy lift. Um, but if you could go ahead and give us any updates on the project and anything that we should be looking at, that would be great. Um, sure. Do you, uh, so since this is the first full planning board meeting, I did a small presentation at the PRC. Do you want me to do a short? No, let's do that. Okay. All right. Can people see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, the building we're talking about is, um, it was uh, formerly occupied by Encodema. We helped to move Encodema out to Dryden. And so uh, Link and Stream are looking to repurpose the building um, for what we think is an interesting project. Uh, it's in a residential zone, uh, but we're trying to incorporate some other features to it too, to make it interesting. Um, and so we'll see that in a few minutes. Uh, this is the existing building. Um, just to give people a frame of reference, there's existing parking on the north side of the building. Um, there's kind of a gravel and some asphalt type uh, on the east side of the building. And then there's also existing parking on the south side of the building. Um, we're going to, uh, oh, just to sort of show you what the existing building, very manufacturer based um, sort of building, metal, corrugated, not very interesting. There's one end of the building, and then the other end has some existing uh, office space in it uh, for that was being used by Encodema. Again, very manufacturing sort of aesthetic. Um, <clears throat> so our plan is to repurpose the building, not really touch the footprint of it um, so much, um, but try and really uh, spruce up the outside, um, the interaction with the street and the road, um, green up the parking lots a little bit, but still utilize them for parking, um, get rid of the asphalt on the east side of the building. Um, the, again, there's, there are potentially views um, from the east side out to the inlet, um, down to the children's garden and places like that. Um, we're trying to kind of green it up and also give outdoor spaces for some of the residential units. Uh, we're looking at short-term and long-term residential. Um, and that's what these sort of deck areas would be on the east side. Um, a larger deck area just outside our, our proposed conference space. The uh, west side, the street side, uh, we're looking at a few retail, about six retail, currently retail spaces uh, on the street side. And then the office space uh, that's in the north uh, west corner, uh, we retain that as office space. Um, and then also sort of a, uh, we wanna include a, a lounge type feature in the middle of the building, um, partly to work with some of the residential and also with the conference type space. Um, let's scroll down a little bit. So here's a little bit of the, planting plan, as you can see, you know, really trying to sort of soften the edges of the existing spaces, give some buffers of both visual and um, nighttime light um, buffers to neighbors. Um, and 
Let me see. And to start giving you a sense of what the facades are looking like, trying to maintain a, an industrial aesthetic to it, uh, but really opening it up both on the outside and the inside with lots of windows, lots of doors, lots of glass, bringing natural light into the space, and then also softening the lower portions of the building with uh, natural wood on the exteriors uh, to really kind of give it a little bit more warmer feel to that industrial look. We, re we, we will reskin the entire building. So even the corrugated metal industrial look will be new. It gives us the opportunity to uh, do energy upgrades at the same time. Um, and then let's look at a few. So these are some of the, let me make that bigger. Uh, so these are a few renderings just to give a feel. Um, we're still working on some of the details of the facades, um, but this is the direction we're going in. Wood on the sort of lower portions, corrugated metal up, up top. Um, opening it up with a lot of glass, especially on the street side, trying to create a connection with the sidewalk, you know, maybe a cafes in this retail space. Uh, we're not exactly sure who the tenants are yet. Um, and then on the back side, uh, the hillside, the residential areas will, you know, all have decks and or patios, trying to really connect the indoor space with the outdoor space and really cleaning it up currently, you know, it sort of was industrial use. It's where the dumpsters were and everything else. And so we really want to clean it up and make it more, much more inviting for the, uh, for the people staying there, but then also the public. Uh, just a few more shots of the exterior on the residential side. Uh, the more long-term would have a little bit more space. Obviously, we'd like to be able to give them sort of garden space besides sort of a, uh, an outdoor patio type area to hang out in. Um, and then um, we're also talking about trying to connect the path down to uh, so sort of the children's garden, Cass Park area, um, the idea being a, uh, using helical piles. So um, they're, uh, they're twisted into the ground, not pounded into the ground, uh, but using helical piles to minimally impact the hillside while creating a boardwalk style um, trail down the hillside. Um, so try and be sensitive to the hillside and the environment there, but also create a really nice connection between the site and the park space below. Uh, and this would be completely open to the public as well. It's not just for uh, people staying at, you know, at the site. It's uh, completely open to all residents and, and public in general. Um, I think that's about all I have to share just to keep it short and quick. Thank you for that. Yep. Um, we only have to do the one action tonight, but it's worth giving initial feedback uh, before we do that. Let's go around the room. Mackenzie, I would start with you. Thank you. Um, this is my first time really looking at it, you know, this mailing, and um, I'm so excited about this. I really love adaptive reuse. It's so, um, it's really attractive and it seems really usable. I have um, just a few comments um, and questions. One is, you don't have to have this answer right now, but I'm curious about the breakdown of the long-term rental or tenancy, you know, like what, like sizes and who you might imagine being there. Um, and as far as like a conference space, um, maybe this is still kind of a preliminary idea, but you know, there was a whole lot that went into like the like downtown needing a conference space. And so I would want to make sure that you're piggybacking on like having realistic expectations about what can be expected for just, you know, just outside of the downtown area. Um, and then I love the, um, uh, the trail bridge. That's awesome. I, this, this area, you know, because Cliff Street can be like kind of fast, even though it's right at the edge of town, like um, signage is one thing that we'll want to see, like, and, and that relates to my question around like what, there are two existing curb cuts or more and, how, what will the flow of like entrance and exits be? Cause um, if you're adding a lot of, I don't know, you know, like I feel like the, um, the parking lot was never very like, busy. There wasn't a whole lot of traffic, but it sounds like this, this new development would create more 
ins and outs. And so I just want to make sure that like pedestrian access and car flow are all kind of jiving together. Um, you can speak to any of those things when we get to the end of the round or not. I just, just the thoughts that I have, um, but really, really awesome building. I'm excited about it. Thanks, Mackenzie. Uh, Elizabeth. Yeah, Mackenzie, I really like the building too. Those um, back decks are really nice. You're on a roll there, Craig, Craig with the uh, designs. Um, I'm excited to hear more about it. Thank you. Uh, CJ. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, this is the first time I'm seeing it too. Uh, it, there's uh, four parcels involved in the, in the development. Is that right? And there, there's actually six different tax parcels, I believe, okay. involved. And then there's another one or two owned across the street, also by the same entity. But there's, I believe, six parcels that are all grouped into this one project, yes. Okay, and the city owns the land to the... And the city, city owns the land to the east, yes. We've already okay. discuss, started discussions with um, different people in the city, Tim Logan, uh, Gene Grace, and whatnot okay. about the path and how that might happen. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I uh, love the adaptive reuse, like uh, to echo Mackenzie's comments. Um, thanks. Mitch. Yeah, great, great reuse. We talked about this at PRC, really nice project. Thanks for taking it on and reusing that building. Um, love the path down. Uh, curious to know if there'll be any views to the inlet or beyond from those units off the back, or if it's just too much forested area and you can't see through it. And then I had mentioned the um, curb cuts and safety issue about right ins, right outs, uh, left outs, and the sort of speed of traffic on Cliff Street there and having those curb cuts so close to the building and being able to see around the corner of that building um, and whether those curb cuts might be um, rethought um, in terms of safety. So, but otherwise, you know, great, great stuff. Thank you. Uh, Emily. I don't have much to add. I think it's a great project, high quality materials. I like that you're still going for an industrial look, even though you're repurposing the shell, it kind of nods to the history of it. And even though it's maybe a recent history, but I like the aesthetic. Um, and I think all the other points are good, the safety. Um, of the curb cuts. And uh, I hope we can see the connection to Cass Park happen as well. Thank you. Garrick. Yeah, uh, like Emily, I, I don't have much to add. Uh, I've been on this board for, I don't know, about a decade now. And it, it's rare to find a project that, uh, I mean, the word that comes to mind is delights me. It's just such a clever, interesting, you know, it's interesting in the architecture and the design but also in the purposing, I mean, the, the programming that's going to go on there. And it's just such a, a, a fun and whimsical change of use. So uh, big thumbs up. Well, excellent. Um, so you've heard some comments, you've heard some enthusiasm. Uh, it sounded like none of those comments necessarily had to be addressed today. We've got a, we've got a whole process ahead of us, but anything that you want to respond to now would be a reasonable time to do so. Yeah, I think, uh, go, go, go ahead, uh, Craig, if you want. Uh, I just wanted to just to hit some of the logistics, um, logistical questions off the bat. Um, so like currently the breakdown, we're looking at six, uh, 400 square foot sort of short term um, rentals, uh, six longer term rentals at 575 square feet um, and about six uh, retail spaces that are about 650 square feet each, which could be combined and mixed and matched depending you know, on the tenant for the retail. Um, as far as the traffic flow, uh, I, I just want to say that, you know, currently we're, we're actually thinking that the traffic's not going to be any more than what, um, it, what Nkotama had. And to be honest, there won't be tractor trailers coming and going. Uh, so in some ways it'll probably be easier. Uh, the curb cuts that we have are the existing curb cuts. Um, New York state DOT is not usually very happy to, about changing curb cuts if they're existing too much, uh, but we will be having those conversations with them and see what makes the most sense for safety 
and visibility and everything else. Um, the only last thing I would just want to comment on is the, the views. We're really looking forward to and hoping for some views. Uh, there's a lot of invasive species on the back hillside. Um, so it's just a matter of coordinating with Gene Grace and really identifying which are the main trees that should go away uh, because they are invasive and selectively opening up different spaces um, so that we can capture sort of good snapshot views uh, for, for everybody, really. Thank you very much. Um, we do have an action before us. We should go ahead and take that. Is there a motion to declare lead agency on this project? I saw Elizabeth move and Garrick second. Um, because we are doing roll call votes on resolutions now, I will do a roll call vote. Uh, no discussion needed on a de declaration of lead agency. McKinsey, could I start with you? Yes, I vote in favor. Elizabeth. Yes. CJ. Yes. Mitch. Yes. Garrick. Affirmative. Emily. Yes. And I vote yes as well. So you have a lead agent on this project. Uh, any other questions or comments from board or staff before we wrap up on this for tonight? Seeing none. Uh, thank you very much for your time. It's a great project. Thanks, guys. Thank you. That brings us to 615, 617 Cascadilla Street. Is this Daniel Hurtler? Is this Dan Hurtler? Applicant, named owner. Yes, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Dan, you're muted. There you go. Start the video. Is Daniel Hurtler? Yep. Oh, you need to turn off your live stream. Oh, right. There we go. There we are. All righty. Um, so we have a declaration of lead agency before us tonight and a public hearing that is not going to be an actual public hearing, but a period for public comment. Um, before we do that, uh, if you have anything to present uh, before the public hearing, we would be excited to see it. Okay, um, let's see, so, hold on, here we go, share screen, and, okay, so, um, so I have to share it from here, is that what happens, um, let's see, so do I have to have, I have to have uh, um, files open, is that what it is? Uh, you can share what's on your screen. So if it's if it's on your screen, you can. Okay, so I do that here first. Okay, good. Um, hold on for a sec. And okay, so you have site plan of view and site plan submission. Okay, here we go. There we go. So uh, and then share screen and. There we go. Is that doing it? Can you see uh, that? We can. Okay, great. So um, this project is um, uh, the address of this project in the end will be uh, 615 and 617 Cascadilla Street. It's um, uh, proposed that we take uh, three existing parcels, uh, combine them, uh, and create a place for uh, four two-family uh, dwellings and the accessory parking that would um, uh, be required. Um, so in this particular plan, this is the site plan, um, uh, along the top edge of the screen is Cascadilla Street, and on the left-hand side of the screen is uh, North Meadow Street. Um, so what we're considering doing is uh, uh, putting the housing on Cascadilla Street um, with uh, a pedestrian sidewalk that runs through the center 
um, and, and has each of the four um, uh, two family dwellings uh, um, accessed off of that um, central uh, pedestrian way, uh, which would also connect to uh, covered bike uh, parking, which is um, actually you can see my where the little uh, palm is, um, which would also be next to the um, uh, parking, which would be accessed off of North Meadow Street. Uh, the, um, hold on for a sec, um, there we go. Um, the um, building elevations, there we go. And uh, here we go, actually. There we are. Are we still, are we still sharing? We still see we, your site plan with the you layouts. See, you do. Okay. So um, you have to stop your share and share something different. Oh, is that how that works? Yeah. Okay. So um, I've lost everything. There we go. So this should be, is this full screen? No. Are we? Well, I don't know how to do this. So we're still so, seeing uh, the same thing. Yeah, there we go. So I just I just so stopped I, your share. So start again. Great, great. Okay, so now um, oh, there we go. New share. Um, and this is on my screen at the moment. Are you seeing the elevations? We are seeing your desktop background. Okay, so that means I have to. Here we go. Is is it showing now? No. Well. Um, I don't know. I um, <laughs> you figured out. <laughs> I don't know how to do this. So uh, anyway, the um, the buildings uh, along. It, so you're still. So we don't have. There's nothing at all there. Uh, it looks like you've stopped sharing your screen entirely. Stopped. I stopped it because it was the wrong thing. So. Oops. Yeah. Well, I don't know. It's um, it so if, if it's here, is it now? Do you see it? Yes. Oh, they, 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 yeah, there we go. There now. So you got elevations, yes. Okay, so um, so this um, so uh, in this area, this, this is the uh, Cascadilla Street um, uh, elevation. So there's uh, a series of three buildings that are on the left hand side. Um, that um, these are the uh, front elevations of. Um, they, um, they're detached buildings, but they're, of, uh, they're um, the same floor plan, each of the three. Uh, they work off of that central sidewalk. Um, the uh, other building that is 617, this, is this uh, set of three is 615 A, B, and C. Uh, a 617, which is um, a narrower building, uh, and uh, is a little bit taller. Um, that's another two-family uh, two dwelling that uh, also works off of the, uh, the central sidewalk. So uh, that's, that's pretty much uh, how this thing works. Thank you very much. Um, before we move into- And how do we stop sharing? How do we stop sharing this thing? Because it says new share, but how does it stop? There, I believe someone it, stopped it for you. I just That's fixed it for you, Dan. Fine, thanks. Yeah. Um, so before we move into public hearing, let's declare ourselves lead agent on this project. Is there a motion to declare ourselves? I say Algaric move and Elizabeth second. Uh, no discussion needed. We'll go ahead and go around the room. I'll start with McKinsey. Yes. Elizabeth. Yes. CJ. Yes. Mitch. Yes. Garrick. Yes. Emily. Yes. And I vote yes as well. You have a lead agent. Uh, we don't need to move public hearing because this is not an official public hearing, but I'll ask Lisa if there are members of the public wishing to speak. There are not. Are there any comments that were, that, uh, were requested to be read before the board? No. Well, okay, that's brief. Um, with that, uh, we'll stop with the non-public hearing, go straight into feedback for the project. Mackenzie, could I again start with you? Yeah, I really like this. Um, 
you know, I, I would love to see, um, you know, context, contextual elevations, I guess, with neighboring houses and stuff like that. But um, in general, I think that this looks like appropriate and attractive. Um, I look forward to talking about materials and things too, but I think for just like for the first, for the first view, I, uh, I have positive reflections of it. So thank you. Thank you, Mackenzie. Elizabeth? Yeah, I think so far so good. No more comments. Thank you. CJ? Um, yeah, same, just echoing what Mackenzie said. Thanks. Mitch? Yeah, I, I think you've done a really nice job of creating a kind of interior space that's really quite interesting and the architecture looks uh, really nice. I'd love to see some uh, perspective views uh with the building dropped into its context so from meadow street and also from cascadilla about what this thing looks like from from all sides uh as you would experience it um, walking on the sidewalk or in a car but good start thank you uh garrick yeah so i, I really like this i mean i think i think daniel this is the third project at least i've seen from you that does a really excellent job of, of finding uh, underdeveloped or uh, undeveloped parts of the city and finding ways to upgrade them and put in, I think it's actually the fourth one, I think from you, uh, sort of of this nature, of uh, finding little blocks of underutilized space and putting housing in there. And I, I appreciate that, that you know, the housing is going into walkable neighborhoods. It's a reasonable density. So in terms of the project keeping with the comprehensive plan, I think it scores very highly. Um, in terms of the particular design, uh, I don't know if anyone else on the board was around other than McKinsey, but the adjacent parking lot, so the parking lot, I guess just to the north, is uh, the one that's kitty-cornered from Purity. And there is some history to that parking lot. I see McKinsey nodding. Um, because, you know, in general, I, I think the design, the design guidelines for Route 13 discouraged putting the parking lot on the corner. And I remember we had a long debate about the parking lot just to the north of where yours would go. And I, I think then the conclusion was that it, it was going to be the best looking parking lot in Ethica with uh, lots of landscaping and, and so on. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that's pretty much held true. I know there's a lot of vegetation down there um, and it, it's pretty thick in vegetation. Anyway, um, the nice thing is that, you know, Wet Meadow Street uh, at that point is northbound only. And I think that you have landscaping on what would be the north side of the entrance to your parking lot. So I guess only I would ask, it's a small thing, is that if you could just kind of carry through, you know, the, the high quality landscaping through what is it that you know five or six feet where it would be yeah. between your parking lot and Route 13 just to, to since we you know we did ask Purity to do such a nice job in their corner parking lot we could just extend kind of Purity's landscaping down another five or six feet southbound on the edge of of your project and Route 13 so it all fits together uh, I think that would do a very nice job of kind of keeping the parking. Uh, you know, a, a way, I mean, keeping the parking lot kind of out of sight, you know, a little bit hidden. And the nice thing is that as, as people are pulling out of the, the parking lot, since it's one way northbound, even if you had pretty lush vegetation on the north side of that parking, it wouldn't be a safety hazard or anything because people will be looking southward to see if there's incoming traffic. So uh, anyway, I think the whole design works really well. Um, you know, I just, I like the way you integrate everything together. So that those are my comments. Thank you. Well, thank you. Emily. I didn't know the history of that parking lot because my comment was going to be, I'm so glad you put a parking lot facing <laughs> Route 13. Um, I understand the rationale and I agree with what Garrick said to try to make it the most beautiful parking you can in terms of uh, planting. But I think for the residents of this pocket neighborhood you're creating, you've done a good job to insulate and isolate them from Route 13 as best you can. Um, and I really like the green space on the south side. Um, so I think it's a great start and a, a nice little addition to the neighborhood. Thanks. 
Uh, so you've heard, you know, uh, uh, a fair bit of feedback and I think some consistent support for the project. Uh, the only thing I'll add is uh, I, I like the project a great deal. Um, I think when I looked at it, I felt like the three buildings that were of a piece and in kind were maybe a little bit more developed than the long, long thin building. Uh, and that long, thin building is going to be super visible uh, from Route 13. It's going to be, you know, the most visible part of your project. So I hope when we dive into the design, we, we you know, really, you know, pay attention to that building and, and uh, make that what it can be. But no, it's a great project. It's a great, great site for this type of use. Well, thank you. Um, anything else, questions or comments from board or staff? All right. Well, I think that's it for today and we'll see you next month. Well, thank you. Uh, we already did our zoning appeals, which is great. Um, that brings us to old new business. Lisa, You're muted. You... Sorry. Do you want me to share the report? That'd be great. Okay, so, oops, you see that? So this item is, so as you may remember, some of you have done this before, some of you maybe not, when there's a proposal by the um, Ithaca Landmarks, uh, Hist Landmarks Commission that um, uh, there's an expansion of a district or a designation of a new um, historic, um, um, historic resource that it, as it goes to common council for a vote that the planning board prepares a report. So I drafted this report. It's very, um, again, it's um, very uh, uh, prescribed what it has to cover. Um, and so this is the description of the, of the, the proposal. Uh, this is what the planning board is supposed to do from the report. Talk about the relation to the comprehensive plan. It is in a resident, mostly residential district B B one as well, but it really so really you know one of the very few um, um, recommendations for the comp plan that it touched on was designation of uh, additional resources. So in that way, it was consistent with the comp plan. Um, it's in three zones that I just wrote what their uses are and. Um, and that the expansion of the historic district wouldn't affect zoning in any way. Um, public improvement. So that's what is the, you know, are there city projects in that area? It's a, again, it's primarily residential, um, some uh, business area. So it's really a, limited to um, sidewalk construction. Um, last year or two years ago, we re redid the Aurora Street Bridge. So that's already been done. So there's nothing planned. Um, and the renewal is like, you know, urban renewal. There are no urban renewal uh, projects planned. So again, this is the district. And um, that is the report. If you would like to change it or add anything to it, uh, please let me know. I'd like it to be more, you know, the report the, the the report really doesn't ask for the board's opinion on whether it should be designated. It's just asked for its assessment of the the um, expansion under different categories. But certainly, if you wanted to add a recommendation to extend the, or not, uh, whatever you want, uh, you could add that. So, is there any? questions, comments, or, or proposed edits from the board. Derek. Yeah, I would just note, I mean, there was a letter that came in that I think, you know, made some good points. So I'm, I'm, I'm agnostic, and I think we should be agnostic as to whether these buildings uh, meet the level of historic or not. I'd leave, leave that to others. But in terms of the relationship with the comprehensive plan, uh, the only thing I would say is that Every time you add a, 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 le a level of bureaucracy on uh, the ability of people to renovate, improve, expand, or otherwise make their property better, um, it does sort of raise a barrier and increase costs. And so if we have a goal 
as a city to see more housing and more affordable housing and improvement of existing housing and so on, that anything that makes that a little bit more difficult, you know, has potentially a, a little bit of a negative effect. I'm not saying this should weigh in one way or another, but I just think it's worth noting that it is putting an additional cost on people improving their properties, a, a bureaucratic cost of applying and potentially sometimes in order to comply with historic district uh, regulations, the cost of renovation or improvement could be substantially more. And certainly it does limit the ability of people to put on additions or additional floors or otherwise expand their property. So I would just think that should be noted. Thanks, Garrick. Uh, Mitch? You know, at the same time, um, improvements of historic houses that don't have guidelines can lead to detrimental effects. And we've seen that a lot, which impact the historic nature of some of our buildings and streets in town. And I think, you know, I think there's a balance here you have to find, you have to strike a, find, you know, strike a balance. And you're right, we're not really here to dictate what's historic and what's not. But I, I want to counter what you just said, Garrick, and say that there are some really detrimental improvements over the years that have taken place that really ruin good buildings. And, and, and that's a loss for the city. So I think there's, a, there's kind of a nice goal behind this, but yeah, more regulations, not necessarily a great thing. Other questions or comments, uh, special proposed edits from members of the board? Mackenzie. No proposed edits, but yeah, just to kind of hit home that once, once historic resources are gone, they're gone, we can't get them back. And I think as Ithaca is booming and there's lots of new development, it feels wise and prudent to preserve um, and you know create historic designation. Um, and as far as regulation goes, in my memory, I can't recall any time that like historic designation truly stopped a project. I know that it has created um, speed bumps for some, but I don't feel like it's ever made something impossible. Maybe that's because things don't get to us if they're impossible, but you know what I mean? Like, I feel like um, ILPC is um, reasonable to work with and the planning board supports historic development and stuff like that. So, yeah, I'm in favor of more designation. Any more questions or comments or proposed edits from the board? Saying none, uh, we don't take a vote on this, right, Lisa? This just exists and we're comfortable with it. Well, I mean, I, I think we're comfortable with it. Um, you know, I, I appreciate you doing it. Uh, looks like next up, we have site plan review process improvements. So since Nikki started, she's been, you know, we've been talking about different ways to improve things. So I thought it might be nice for you to hear some of the things that she's doing. Um, and also your suggestions on things you might think are important. Yeah, suggestions would be very helpful. Um, yeah, so I'm trying to streamline the process a little bit here internally, looking at creating um, timelines and tasks for you know intakes, et cetera, for the flow of things. Um, and also looking at like creating a flow chart for projects of limited scope. So that's kind of internal for the staff to make the steps easier. Um, for the applicant, thinking of creating resources for them, some extra resources, probably at the, you know, the application packet. Um, one of which would be for the planting plans, planting plan resources. So links for invasive plants, particularly in Tompkins County, there's a, a great resource for that. Um, alternatives for these invasive plants. So we're not just giving them, you know, don't plant these, but this is what you can plant instead. Um, and then I've seen so far some plans that have bioretention, but really no bioretention plants. So some links really for some bioretention plants and rain garden plants that people could use in their, in their plants. Um, another thing that came up, especially with this meeting from the um, historic Ithaca um, is also maybe making sure in our list that we are looking for maybe in the demolition plan ways, opportunities to salvage materials in buildings. I think that was a really valid point and one that we should be looking at more in particularly. And then another thing that I'm working on with Jean Grace, our wonderful arborist, is a um, tree ordinance, looking at closing that loophole of um, 
some developers and other people, you know, with infill where they can right now clear cut properties and then go ahead and apply for the submit a site plan review afterwards. So really trying to um, work on a, a tree ordinance. And that is what I have right now. If you have any suggestions, you guys have been in this longer for site plan review, streamlining, help making it easier for applicants. Or Sounds like a good list. Um, anything that we've said at people for, for us to add. And of course we can follow up in addition as we, yeah. as we move forward right. here together. Absolutely. Emily. We, uh, at one point we talked about a short list of things that, that we could use as a checklist, but also maybe give applicants. And one was like dumpster enclosures, um, trash, like trash plan, bike racks. Go, bike racks, enclosures for the HVAC on the roof. Um, I can't remember the rest, but yeah, sometimes so, it, yeah. it jumps. Go ahead, go ahead, Lisa. Yeah. Yeah. So like sometimes we get really focused on one thing and then we forget about the trash enclosure yeah, right. or something like that. Right. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. So a short list of things to include, Emily, or were you thinking? Yeah. Maybe or, to give to the applicants up front yeah. that we're going to look for these five or 10 things. Yeah. yeah. And if they can even just tell us what their strategy is up front. And, and yeah. then we have the list too, and we can follow up on it. Derek, I saw your hand. Uh, if we're, if we're, are we, are we thinking of items put in that list? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, one, I, my number one item, and I think it's one McKinsey mentions a lot too, is it would be really, really great. I, I don't know if, I don't know if we can require it, but I just wish every applicant would talk to their neighbors before they would come see us. Yeah. I mean, it just every single time. And it just seems to be that they, Applicants always want to think that they're going to wait to the last minute and that's going to help them. And I think the opposite is true. You know, if they would talk to the neighbors to begin with, they can agree to disagree, but it's just like our meetings are not the best forum for applicants and neighbors to be discussing for the first time what's going on. Yeah, I couldn't agree with that more strongly. Um, and I don't know how that fits in with us in our process. We can, I mean, we meet with them before they, um, before they submit and uh, you know, we can tell them that too, but. Is it on the application? Sorry? I thought it was on the application that you have to contact your neighbors. Yeah, but that I think what Garrick is saying is bef there's a legal requirement that they have to do that, but I think we're talking about before they do the legal, fulfill the legal requirement just to start telling their neighbors what they're up to. And, or more right. personable communication. Is that what you meant, Garrick? I mean, because there is a legal letter that goes out to the surrounding neighbors. But. Yeah, the, the problem is that, I mean, this happens every single time, is by the time the neighbors are contacted, there are architectural renderings and elevations being circulated and so on. And so it, it, it tends to, I mean, how many times, Rob, have we had a reaction where someone comes to the first meeting of a project and say, I just heard about this two days ago. I mean, it happens every single time. And um, I, I, I just think that, that the applicants would be better off if there were, had at least been one meeting. And, you know, and it's, it's non-binding. The, the applicant can disagree with every single complaint the neighbor has. But at least we just didn't get that, I just heard about this yesterday comment. Yeah, I mean, and, and CJ's hands up next. And I, I don't want to don't want to delay that. But I'll say that to me, it, you know, it, if you're a real professional developer, you're on that, right? Like you're, 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 you've got your ducks in a row and it's just part of, you know, keeping things smooth so you don't get surprised at these meetings. Um, and I think that, you know, in some instances, there's not that level of professionalism. And I don't know how we can say you guys, you know, you guys need to be professional in the way you talk to your neighbors. It's not just enough to send a notice. Um, but, you know, it's, it's true. They should be. And it's not just enough. Uh, CJ. Uh, yeah, so I would concur with the recommendation that um, perhaps it's recommended that applicants um, you know, reach out to uh, surrounding properties informally. And I hate to really take a contrarian position in this way, but um, there are, you know, rights that people have to be able to apply, um, you know, and, and there's some kind of some history of, you know, a neighbor that may not be so, um, you know, neighborly, shall we say, and perhaps, you know, talking to them, um, you know, 
in the past, you know, trying to get uh, neighbor kind of permission or okay before you apply, you know, has some, um, I don't know, maybe not so favorable um, instances, you know, so just saying. Hear that. Uh, Mitch. Uh, I just wanted to say that I'm really happy to hear about the tree ordin ordinance. That's great news. And um, maybe you said this, but I hope that it will include requirements for developers who are taking down large trees and replacing those not with two inch or even three inch caliper trees, but something that is substantial enough to replace a 16 inch caliper, 60 foot high, whatever tree it happens to be. And inver invariably we see projects that come through that are just knocking down these big trees and we're getting tiny two inch caliper trees to replace. And I, it's not enough. And I think we're in a, a development environment right now where if the developer really wants to do the project, they have to come forward with some bigger tree material to replace that, the things that, that are being lost. No, that's a great point. And definitely will address that. Kinsey. Um, thank you, Nikki, for you know working on all this and taking our suggestions. Um, something else that I feel like we ask every project is about like you know affordability and tax abatements and stuff. And I know that's not quite design, but I feel like I wish developers were more transparent about that. It often feels like they kind of want to not let us know that they have um, profit-driven motives. Um, development is a business, we know that, but I feel like for the public at least, and for us understanding like if they're prioritizing affordable units or paying into the fund, how much and how much and um, and what the rationale is and if they're going for tax abatements or whatnot, I just think that those things are, um, they're part of the process. So I feel like if we didn't have to like dig for that information and people could just kind of let us know right away. That would be really helpful. I think the public would appreciate that level of communication. Those topics matter a lot to everybody. Emily, I think I skipped you. That's okay. I wanna start asking about um, how each project complies with the new Ithaca green building policy, which I believe goes into effect in August to receive a permit, is that right? That's right. So any project that applies you know, after, after the 90 days, you know, they have to comply. So after like August, whatever it was, maybe the 4th of August, any new projects that submit applications will have to comply. So um, Emily, I wanna ask you a question about that. Yeah. Do you mean like, I don't see the, any, I don't see like a role for the planning board in this. This is gonna be a building code review, but would you like somebody to come and explain to the board how it's all going to work? Or would you, or yeah, I mean, would if we you, can, go ahead. Yeah. Like a synopsis maybe from them about how they're going to comply because there's different ways of complying too. Right? I think that would be useful for everybody. Um, I've been reading up on it because I have to, my projects have to comply. Right. So I understand it's a point-based system. I mean, if we can ask about finances and about um, affordability and ask them to meet with their neighbors. I feel like even though maybe we can't regulate it, we can still ask mm -hmm. what's the point system? How are you yeah. achieving your five points or six points as yeah. a, as a starting point to maybe um, jump into more sustainability materials, HVAC systems, everything. Yeah, I agree with that. I assume we'll get into it with Luis next, next month. Um, you know, it's more Nick's thing, but um, I, yeah. that's a really good question and about, that's a really good point. Like how can, I don't know what form it's going to take that they're going to submit it to the building division, but there should be like a, a more planning, planning friendly um, synopsis of what, okay, how are you going to meet the building code? Yeah. Anybody else have things for Nikki's list? Rob, I just add, I, by the way, I, I agree completely with CJ. I'm only making recommendations, but people have legal property rights and that they have a right to privacy and not to disclose information until it's required. So I completely agree. Uh, it's just a recommendation. But I would point out that, you know, af affordable housing projects are amongst the most controversial projects. And if I think of, you know, historically uh, back on our applicants, the 
applicant who builds ar you know, arguably the biggest and most controversial project is also the applicant who does the best job of having open houses and soliciting neighborhood feedback. And that's INHS. And they always have these open houses and they put pictures up of what they're going to do and have comment cards and whatever. And I think they have the most successful track record. So that doesn't mean it's going to be the right way forward for every applicant, but for some applicants, I think it works to their advantage. Thanks. Um, anything else? I'll say thank you very much, Nikki, for taking that on. It sounds like a big list. Thank you. Thanks for all the suggestions. Um, brings us to reports. Uh, I don't have anything as planning board chair other than to say I will almost certainly not be here next month. I will hopefully have a one month old. Um, and uh, I really appreciate everybody helping us, uh, you know, get through this meeting as efficiently as we did. Um, you know, these Zoom meetings have been, you know, they've gone about as well as one could hope for, really. Uh, and, you know, I, I really appreciate everybody's help with that. Uh, BPW liaison. Uh, nothing to report. All right. Uh, Director of Planning and Development. I don't have a report tonight. All right. Well, I think that's it. Thanks again. And is there a motion to adjourn? Eric moves, McKenzie seconds. All in favor? Have no a good discussion? night. No discussion. <laughs> 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 good luck, Rob. Good night. Thanks, guys.